<laughs> plenty super, of coffee. <laughs> super excited uh, for this because we've been trying to link up for, I don't know, a few months. You're yeah. busy. I'm busy. You're local. So we take advantage of that. We're just like, yeah, we'll get it done next week. Mark Twite. Thanks, man. You're welcome. Really Thank you for having me, you guys. I, uh, yeah, when Trevor said, hey, we're going to do it finally. And I was like, okay, let's, this is great. I got to go there. We can't do it at my place because I get too comfortable in my place. I just sit back in that chair and start drinking tequila. And the big yeah. comfy chair. goes nowhere fast. Those are those are super comfy. Yeah. They are. No, yeah. as opposed to we just got you super jacked up on coffee right yeah. before. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're I used to tequila? Just, How about some coffee? Evan Taste fed this. you two shots of espresso plus a big pour over. Yeah. So but it's a little bit different. Appropriate because I did have a rather long drive yesterday and was not, and didn't get home till one. 45 this morning. Oh, wow. That's, that's okay. So, I don't know. I, I know a lot about you. Uh, and I think, you know, all of us, we, we know a lot about you, I guess. But one thing I was reading today on in your biography when I was yeah. like, well, how do you describe yourself? <laughs> and it's interesting because I don't know who wrote this, but you define yourself as a climber first. Is that right? Is that still accurate or is it... I I, I have to say, I mean, it's where I came from. Yeah. So, like, it's what made me. Right. And it, so I can't completely um, disassociate myself from that identity. Like, yeah. And even though I don't do it and haven't done it for a really long time, mm-hmm. um, those are the roots. And uh, I found myself last year uh, at the tail end speaking up at the Banff Mountain Book and Film Festival again, right. which was super weird to go back in that environment after. I think the last time I was there was probably 1995 or something. Last oh, wow. time I gave a presentation there and like to, you know, cruise back in, start seeing old friends. And we're like, I guess we're all older. <laughs> 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 and some of the, and a lot of those guys are, you know, still going climbing. And, and it's very, it's very interesting. It's not a topic for me to, that I find interesting to talk about with them. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I remember before you left, you're like, "Do they know what they're asking of me to get up there?" <laughs> Why? Is, what, what? What? I mean, it j- j- just uh, I, I used to do a lot of multimedia presentations. Yeah. Going, I was like part of the way that I earned my living, and um, did a really cool. Um, I mean, I got presented up there twice, and uh, um, but it's like time travel, you know. Right. So the last big route that I did in the mountains was in. It was 20 years ago. Wow. Almost, you know, June 25th and 26th of 2000. Um, I still went climbing a little bit after that, mostly teaching for when I had military jobs yeah. to do. But for my own, I never really went again after that. And to go back into that headspace was um, quite a trip. Yeah, but- I can imagine when you – when you, you know, left or decided that you, did you, was that an active decision where oh, you're yeah. saying like, I'm not going to do this anymore or like how, it, how did that, it, how did that come to be? It was a net, it, like we had been various climbing partners, um, Barry Blanchard and Scott Backies and then Steve House um, had been progressing towards this ideal of like the single push ascent mm-hmm. of like, man, if you don't carry anything and you don't stop, you can go pretty far. And uh, <laughs> you have no safety net, you're not going to fall. <laughs> True. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's right. almost always when yep. you, you know, you trip on your fucking crampons on some easy terrain. It seems to be how it happens a lot. But, um, wow. uh, and, and so this big thing we did in 2000 in Alaska, I realized that the next step was to take that same ideal to the Himalayas. Right. And so, cause we'd been practicing in the Alps of going for, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours, whatever, nonstop. Um, next thing that Scott and I did in Alaska, that was a, we went 43 hours nonstop on day, day two of a, right. of a 72 hour round trip on uh, a new, a new route on Mount Hunter. And then we realized like, okay, there's a bigger objective here in the Alaska range. And it was this thing that had been climbed once in 1986. Um, it's on the South face of McKinley. It was at the time, arguably the hardest route there when it first got done. And it took the, the team 11 days um, and didn't, and they had a three guys on the face, a couple thousand or a thousand feet of fixed rope that they kept moving. 
kind of siege style. And then they had a support team of three other guys climb an easier route and meet them on top right. when they finished and help them get down. And so from 86 to 2000, a lot of guys had talked about it, trying to repeat it, but no one, I was done by a Slovak team. And um, a lot of guys had talked about trying to repeat it and didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. And a month before we got up there in 2000, um, uh, Kev, or friends of mine, Kevin and Ben, repeated it in seven days. And we were kind of bummed not to make the second ascent, but it didn't right. matter because our style was, we were just like, okay, we're going to launch and we'll take enough food and fuel for 48 hours and either be done or not mm. when that, when it, when it all runs out. And it ended up being, by the time we climbed the face and um, got down to the uh, park service camp at 14,000 feet on the normal route, we'd been moving for 63 hours nonstop. Wow. and. All the food was gone. All the water was gone. All the fuel was gone by that point. And, and then we were done because our friend Meg, who was the ranger at the time, came out and with spam toasted cheese and spam <laughs> sandwiches. And we're like, fuck, we wanted to be completely independent and go down to our cache at 11,000 feet <laughs> but, could, where we ha- could eat some more freeze-dried food, which is yeah. so awesome. Um, but we kindly took her invitation to stop for the night. And, and so, but, but the next step after that was to do that in the Himalayas. And I was like, I don't have, I, I have too much tying me to the ground. Now Scott was the same and we both decided, well, fuck it. Let's check. Let's just do it in total good, um, samurai style and go out at the peak. And, uh, um, and so a couple of years later then, I mean, Steve House went back the next year um, to the infinite spur with Rolando Garibaldi and like, I think a 44 hour rounds trip. And that thing had never been climbed faster than I think nine days at that point. And, um, and then, uh, that would have been 2001. Right. And then some events in the world changed right. the ability to go to the Himalayas for a couple of years. And then eventually Steve went to, went to Pakistan. I think he was one, the first sort of Western team to get back into the mountains after nine 11. Right. Um, you know, getting, he said it was super weird getting picked up at the airport in Islamabad in a, you know, totally blacked out van Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and then get like, get it and, and real, like get, get out of town quick. Right. Um, and went up to, um, uh, a peak called K7 and climbed a new route, uh, by himself on that in a long single push, same kind of thing, 40 hours or so. And, um, and that was just latitude I didn't have in my psychology or professional and familial schedule at the time. Like it was just done. So I said, so I quit. And then the only thing I did was teach for the next few years. And then, um, then that, uh, uh, most of my best, many of my best sort of students, um, went down on the extortion one seven. And, um, that kind of, ended that era right. of r- doing really cool trips with guys, you know, to teach whatever we could. Right. Mm. Well, and as you kind of, I guess, made your transition out and into instructing, was Salt Lake City your home like then, or were you still? I um, mean, the, the, my first introduction with, you know, the first jobs I did for the military, I was li- actually living in Boulder. It started, yeah. um, uh, at the time. And so, um, did a couple of jobs like in Colorado or Mm -hmm. other places that were more convenient to me. I mean, like, um, and, and Rolo was one of our instructors and he was living there at the time. Um, also, and, Mm -hmm. uh, and then I moved out here and I moved, I spent two years in Salt Lake in the mid nineties, then ended up in, uh, in Boulder for five years. And then came back here in 2001 and been here ever since. So 2001. Yeah. Yeah. I came here in June of 2001, started a business, got it super in debt, you know, before we even had a day of business. (laughs) (laughs) The first day of so-called business was, uh, I think, January 3rd, 2002. And, um... We started that company like half a million dollars in debt. Yeah, tie these ankle weights on and jump in the deep yeah, end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and it just and it, and it just killed out. You know, the whole thing killed the out, outdoor industry, and the you know yeah. Yeah. kept that company alive till two thousand eight, and then by working a variety of other jobs, like right. I was kind of supporting 
like not taking a salary from it and doing either military instruction or other R and D type work outside of that, just trying to keep it alive. And we never got out of debt because of those ankle weights yeah. were rather heavy. <laughs> <laughs> when it's, it, <clears throat> so it's funny for the, for the guys listening to this show back in the late nineties. And I forget exactly what year it was. What, what year did you publish? Um, um Extreme Alpinism was 1999. 99. And then uh, Kiss for Pill was 2001. Okay. All right. So yeah. 2001. Uh, so I belonged to the Mountaineers out there and I was living in Ballard at yeah. the time, just in, in the Seattle area. You had done a book signing and I had gone to the book signing and I, you know, I was just one of multiple people there. And it's funny because you know, I, had, I had both your books and I knew who you were, and I had a, you 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 had a refrigerator magnets for the book for the book. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I still got like a stack of like twenty of those. You, you know, do not. So I do. Oh actually. my god. I, I need still, one. I guarantee. I, I still have some of those refrigerator magnets. And I thought that was like the one of the best marketing things for. It was great. It's fantastic for, for a book. Yeah. Ever, and, and we keep talking about Who gives that over refrigerator a, magnets. That's great. Yeah. I, I mean, do you guys do one? We don't. Yeah. We don't. We haven't we, done that yet. You know, because I found that there are a lot of refrigerators that magnets don't stick on anymore. Not if it's a sticker. It's stickers. We do stickers. Yeah. But what if I a, had... What if it's a magnet so sticker? So in the Mountaineers, that, that night or whenever it was, right, you had a stack of those things. And I scraped probably 10 of them off the table because nice. I was just cheap, I was cheap <laughs> as shit. And, well, Evan, they were free. Yeah, so. exactly. It's like I gave away like, 100 books like, and 200 hey, hey, magnets. Hey, How did this take happen? Like 10 of these. And I had the... And I still missed. do. I, I still have at, probably three or four of them kicking around. Nice. But, Ooh, yeah. You know, I... And I follow different things that you were doing uh because this was like internet i wasn't like really yeah. savvy on the internet but you no, know no. the internet was yeah. new it was new and the war kicked off and then i was kind of like checked the fuck out like i was i yeah. was gone right so the next time i'd kind of heard your name was through the community and it was like oh hey you've got this thing that you're doing and when somebody was like Oh, it's a, uh, you know, Jim Jones and Mark, this is Mark's gym. It's like, holy shit, he has a gym now in Salt Lake. <laughs> and, but that was like fast forward by time. I forget how many years that was. Not too long. Like, like the first sort of experiment, like, so, um, the mountain safety gear import company was mm -hmm. in this building over on state street. Right. Um, and we were renting it, uh, office and warehouse um, from this guy, Steve Denkers, who owned the building. He used to make Evolution skis. It was mm -hmm. like the one of the few custom ski shops, you know, still alive in the States, I guess. And um, he has massive, this huge building that's that's still over now. The uh, guys, um, Swanee and Adam Comey, uh, they run their mountain MSI, which is the sports yeah. promotion business out of there. And, um, and, and I said, look, I want to start this kind of gym thing. And he goes, oh, well, here, take this from upstairs. We can't rent it to anybody right? Um, because there's no ADA access. And he goes, you can just have it. And there was like an old Airdyne in there and a squat rack and a lap pull <laughs> machine that okay. he had like Perfect. fucking traded for some skis to somebody. And it was, you know, it was like the... It, like all Airdynes at the time, you know, probably had some clothes hanging on it yeah, or something. Yeah. It's like yeah. the best clothing rack ever. Right. A nice layer of dust. Yeah. And, and, this, and this building was... Like, so that whole building over there was a bakery at one point. Okay. And so, the, and they built it, um, like they made the bakery inside, the, like, I think they must've built the building around it because mm -hmm. this original space that we had, I go up there on the South wall, there's just like the bricks had obviously been like pushed out, something taken out of there. And then the bricks put back R broken windows, no insulation, <laughs> Um, and so that, so that's the, the room that we originally had, had like this giant, that's where they mixed all the dough to make all the bread. And then it would go downstairs to the ovens and, right. and then conveyor belts and shit like that. And, and, uh, and so there was a, there was a whole weird stainless steel raised thing. So when the dough spilled out or when they had to wash that machine, it would just, you know, they could go down in that mm -hmm. drain hole. And we thought like, well, a drain hole in the middle of the gym is like about the best thing ever. If you're going to like <laughs> start killing people with workouts that are too hard. Right. Right. <laughs> better. Um, and, uh, 
And so that first started like just my, the very first thing was December, 2003. Okay. And then over the course of the next year, um, first I started with working with some different climbers, like, okay, I want to experiment on you yeah, guys. Yeah. And if, if you'll let me use you as, you know, wind dummies or whatever right. for, um, <laughs> then it'll be free. I'll just do it. And, uh, um, and then the website, the initial website uh, went up in like June of 2005, I think. Okay. I remember that. Yeah. And it was all very. I saw those. <laughs> black and white and yep. illegible. Or Ex- experiment videos. I can hear yeah. the music in my head right now. Yeah, the pirated music, yeah. which now I still find on YouTube. And I'm just like. Uh. It's, it, cause it, it, it's, and it's funny because it's le- it, it's like legendary. Yeah. It, because. The people that got, that got exposed to that right away. You're just you and your persona and then meeting you and meeting you a couple times now and your persona two totally different because it's like, this was invitation only. Yeah. You know, y- you had this reputation of just being a, a fucking asshole, like just a fucking <laughs> asshole. And I mean that in a complimentary way. Actually, oh yeah. Because it's, it's like, you can't be a, you can't just be anybody and walk in here and get a membership. You you actually have to to fucking put out. Yeah. And and it's, that, and it's not just to put out. It's, it, it was also like if you – if I feel like you could contribute to the right. experiment, then – then it, then it's it's a, it's useful and then and 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 uh, Lisa who's my business partner and my wife at the time she was really good at like f- casting people essentially like oh here's uh, you know this person fits you know in with this group of people and this person will fit here and can actually contribute this um, and I was just you know blinders on kind of doing my thing and then she'd be like here MMA guy <clears throat> he's got to fight in three weeks fix him. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Will you say a little bit more about that as far as contribute to the experiment and a little bit about your philosophy when it comes to I feel to like that? it hasn't changed either at space now. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's seems like it's been refined, but it's the same thing. Like, I mean, I think in the, like in the beginning, I only wanted to train people for like, I, I thought, okay, all the, I learned all of the lessons about fitness from climbing. Right. Sure. Whereas like, okay, that's a card you don't want to play and, come up with the fucking two of clubs right, right. so mm-hmm. and because it's also totally controllable that's like the hand i can deal myself that yeah. makes it like maybe gives me a better chance of succeeding coming back whatever and so i thought well training for this stuff should matter and how can we do that i only want to train you know first it was climbers and then um lisa started studying brazilian jiu-jitsu and it was at a school and there's a bunch of mma guys that there because back in that day um there was you know once a month or once every three months, whatever at Sandy station, there was, there was fucking fights in the right. bar, you know, they'd like, yeah. okay, no smoking tonight. We'll move this, the stripper poles out or whatever was there <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and roll in the, 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 the cage. And so be, uh, and Jeremy Horn had just moved here at the time or was coming through and there was a bunch yeah. of, and it was, um, it was a kind of a cool time. Cause I think, Permission wise, Utah was one of the only states. I think there were two or three states at that time where you could have mixed martial arts fights or Muay Thai fights or whatever. Um, I think the no elbows in the Muay Thai, but um, uh, that could, it was only one of the states where you could get it permitted and also serve alcohol coincident with the fights. <laughs> Isn't it weird that Perfect. Utah is that place? Yeah. Like, yeah. how did they yeah, end up on the start of that weird. list? Fuck, no what kidding. the hell? <laughs> so, I'm sure Nevada was. Yeah. Yes. But diametrically opposed. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you just Nothing. Need everybody to, you know, cooperate. Cooperate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um. And and so uh, Lisa would bring me some guy or brought me a couple of different people and and uh, that I worked with and I thought, oh, this is something where fitness matters, right? Because it's the thing you can control and technically, like, you don't want to get unconscious because you, you know, didn't look after your fitness, right? Um. And so I thought, okay, this is, this is cool. Plus I don't know how to do it. Like, so I've been trained people for like long duration things or, or very, um, short, powerful sorts of movements, but without a ton of issues with gas or, um, people trying to sure. have their way with you. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it seemed like a thing where, okay, here's something, another thing where fitness matters. Um, and the mili- military context, same thing. Like that was all I wanted to do was stuff where it mattered because if it matters, then you can 
get people to do stuff that they wouldn't normally do. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. like, like it's, it's almost a captive audience. Okay. So somebody wants to lose some weight, um, for, you know, June high school reunion, like, right. I don't, that's, that it doesn't actually matter. So right. people won't work that hard. And, um, and, and so by setting up like all of the early sort of, you know, conditions, um, the culture of the gym developed, like, okay, this is a place where we do stuff for people, you know, help people, you know, uh, who, who depend on a high level of fitness. Right. Because they'll fuck, they'll do the work. Yeah. Like, and because they'll, re- they've realized the in-state, like, okay, you ask any number of these people, like, Hey, when was the last time, you know, you were doing something where, you know, fitness fell short. Right. And those guys are like, Oh, this, 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 and this, and the person off the street, when was the last time? Like, uh, never, uh, ne- like, well, I never really thought about, you know, like, right. yeah. okay. If it doesn't matter, then you have to then set up conditions so that it does. And it turns out like people's brains, they can't really differentiate between financial stress or social stress. And so we would set up things, you know, little competitions or the don't look bad in front of your peers thing. And it's something that Glassman taught me in the beginning. He's just like, men will die for points. Right. And, um, and, and, and not to look bad in front of their friends. So we would set up all these scenarios where like, okay, we, this, this has to matter in order for the output to matter because it taught, you know, in the mountains, I I realized like, man, when you're up against it, there's always more left in the tank or a few more horsepower or whatever. And I just wanted to replicate that in a gym somewhere was those kind of conditions. And, um, and Eventually, it gets to a point where, you know, like I did the first movie job, which was the 300 movie, and people were like, oh, that must be so nice. Working hot, you know, standing there, like, with your clipboard and your stopwatch mm. and getting people to do <laughs> shit. Yeah. And it's like, okay, no, it's like 35 dudes, and this is how they have to look on the day. And this is how much money's riding on this. It's a small budget. That one was sixty million dollar budget for that movie. Right. Yeah, small, small, yeah. It, and and so it and so it really matters because yeah. cameras are going to be rolling on this day, and and, right. and so everybody has to look a certain way. And <laughs> yeah. um, every day that they push past that date, you're oh it's exponentially just, growing the budget. Like I mean, I've I've seen it. Yeah, working or, it working in stunts. It's like okay, well, one more day is going to cost us a million dollars. Right. Like, yeah. hey, excuse me. Yeah. yeah, and then the next day is two. Like, holy shit, this yeah. really does have to happen today. Yeah, and the and the end, the end result is just like, okay, there's, you know, I I feel, I mean, there was a point where I do a Hollywood job, and then I'm just like, okay, I got to do ten, you know, military and intelligence community jobs, uh, in order to balance my karma scale. <laughs> 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 like, yeah. I don't know what that's so true. What that looks like, um, but in but the but the end result is that yeah, it, you don't. Um, missing a de- you know the Hollywood deadline or whatever, or you know either time wise or appearance wise or capability right. wise. Yeah, nobody gets dead, but mm-hmm. um, it costs a lot, and you might never work again if you like. If you have a history of, you might get a second chance if you fuck up one of those jobs, right? Um, and it, and then if you fuck that one up, for sure you're, you're not coming back, right? Uh, and then and happily I was, you know, good enough. You know, well, pretty much on all of those, I guess. Well, it was interesting because in the community, when you when you started started this, it was even very exclusive inside the military community. It was more exclusive, you know. So I was a you know this SF guy, and I was working at the agency, and you know guys were going out and doing this, and I kept on trying to get on these trips to go out there. It's like, I want to go. Hey, home. man. How do I get on one of those trips? <laughs> and it's like, hey, well, does, does he have a gym? Can I just like cruise by there if I'm in Salt Lake? No. Like, I'm like, oh my God, this is like <laughs> it's so infuriating. <laughs> it's like fight cup, but for real. <laughs> Damn it. I know. It was such it was such <laughs> bullshit. I was like, this is such bullshit. And my buddy V Diamond, he owned uh SLC CrossFit and he started that here. And he's a former team guy. Okay. And it's like 
man, can you, can you broker a fucking deal over there? He's like, no, I can't even broker a deal over there, dude. I'm like, this is such bullshit. I was like pursuing this for a while. And then finally I was like, you opened up a uh, membership or something like that yeah. in, the, in the online on the community. On the online space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I'd been following the blog because you had an open blog for a while yep. and you're, you'd yep, post a the, lot of content on there. So it was, I was always reading that stuff. We tried a forum for a while yeah. too, but that was a little bit like and I, and I get the, aggressive. It, I, I don't know. It, it's <laughs> the only other forums I would really go on or the only other one was Brian Enos. And yeah. he had like mm -hmm. a ton of super moderators and anything went wrong on that forum and they would just step on it super hard. Right. I never saw that in the background. I just thought people are on the internet, they're having yeah. really nice conversations here and people are learning stuff and no yeah. one's, yeah. you yeah. know, talking, telling somebody his dick is short or, you know, right. whatever ridiculous things come up. I just as kind of assumed that's how it would be. And then, you know, rude awakening by, you know, the CrossFit forum in the yeah. beginning. And then when we try to do ours, they're like, we're going to police this, police this. And then after a while, people are just um, horrible when they're not going no to have to look. When right. there's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, if there's a repercussion for yeah. something stupid that you're going to say, like a real repercussion, right. like the worst thing that's going to happen is like, oh, I can't go on the internet for a day. Mm -hmm. like, nobody gives a shit. Yeah, or I have to come up with a new username so yeah. I can go back and do the same thing. <laughs> um, so eventually that became kind of a, like a one-way broadcast because, right. you know, yes, I would answer questions if people sent an, you know, uh, an, an email to the public address. Um, but like letting people, you know, paying for the bandwidth mm -hmm. to let people be shitty to each other right. is stupid. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but those, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the sermon pieces, I mean, I would yeah. try to write all, I just, I can't help but write. So right. just have to get it out and get rid of it. You know, once <laughs> yeah. it's out, I'm like, what do I do with it? I don't know if I can post it somewhere. <laughs> and it, and it's so funny because I remember I logged in to do the first, like the first Jim Jones workout that I had, that I, you know, got right. And, and I was, I was like cussing you so fucking much because it was like a 75 mile bike ride or some shit on this. And I'm in Basra in a stationary bike. It's like 138 degrees with no AC in there. And I'm like, all right, well, fuck it. Okay. I guess I'll be on the bike for like four hours. <laughs> I was just saying, so, and talk about them. Like <laughs> there was a, there was a really solid mixture of, Workouts on there, they were yeah. like, like, son of a bitch. Yes, I know. Like, yeah. is this fucking real? Yeah. Did I read this right? <laughs> I know. Did they miss, did they I miss know. putting like a decimal place in here somewhere? Look, is this nope, right? no, it's, it's how it's supposed to be. You know, that's how it today is. Today just right sucks. There. You just, today is going to suck. So I'd have to like frame that workout and yeah. go. And I was like, I remember I was like digging deep on this workout. I don't know how long it was taking me and like, fucking 130 degree Jeez. weather and i'm like oh my god mark you fucking well asshole. like I mean, you can scale yeah. for environmental conditions if well, you're yeah, you know if you're, if you're a, you know if you can't you know hit you the standard hang, or whatever right, like, yeah. I, yeah. I mean you don't it was only 109 be, here right. when i did you know or you something don't have like to be a member it's, yeah. it's fine don't you don't think, have to do it i don't think evan knew what scaling was at that point <laughs> but we <laughs> were do any of us really no, I mean, no, in the, no, <laughs> no. yeah, it's like if somebody did it and look at that dude, he's all, I mean, but I got to say like for a lot of that early on, um, it was really important for me to lead from the front right, and do all the things. So on that, you know, people would ask you like, so what's it like when you do a, you know, Hollywood job or whatever, you like right. show up and you train people for four hours. And I'm like, okay, the original 300 job, I thought I could do it by myself. Turns out I couldn't, I had an assistant, um, like who drove all the gym stuff up from yeah. Salt Lake to Montreal where it was, um, where the whole thing was filmed and we had our gym space and stuff. And, uh, once I realized like, oh, it, it's actually not possible to right. like manage this. Um, so he, Logan st stuck around, um, with me and, uh, but I was in the gym 12 hours, legit 12 hours a day, five days a week. And every, every, you know, we'd do an hour and a half class or whatever, and then I'd get a little 15 to 30 minute break and another class. And so we'd be like running between five and seven guys through of these 35 day started with Zach and his team, um, who was the director. 
So every time, you know, stunt crew or actors came in, they'd see what Zach did on the whiteboard and they're just like, okay, that's the one who's really leading from the front. And so then I would have to get in and like instill this sort of level of competitive flavoring so that the intensity was high enough to, that we could restrict the amount of volume. And, uh, so my weekends were pretty much like, I don't move from my bed in the fucking hotel. Right. Because Monday's coming yeah. early. And a lot of times, you know, on a, on a job where you have, um, you can only shoot for a certain number of hours and then there's a turnaround time, especially for the act, you know, stunt crew less, uh, so, but for actors, it's like, yeah. okay, if they wrap at this time, they can't come back in here till, you know, for, they have to have 15 hours or right. whatever it is. And they can they only come. do so many days in a row and then they have to have a break or you're paying them extra, extra, extra. Gotcha. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. And so we started like, all right, call time is like six o'clock on uh, uh, Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And so then, uh, and it's, you're supposed to be done at six. So let's just say you only went over by two hours that day. So now call can't be till eight the next day and then it goes oh two hours over so then it's 10 o'clock the next day and so pretty soon it's fucking fratter day right. where you're coming in friday afternoon at four o'clock finishing at 4 a.m on saturday and the weekend is just gone um because the, the timeline keeps getting pushed and uh and i was just getting i mean i'm probably you know the some of the mileage that I have on my body today is from those early movie jobs of just being in there, you know, just horrific elbow tendonitis, you know, shoulder issues and stuff. Cause too much, you know, cause I'm working out like five fucking times a day and, and, you know, not being that smart thinking I was invincible. How, how much time did you have between that fitness regiment and when they started filming? So, um, on, on that particular job, I, I, I started going out to LA to work with um, Gerard Butler and I'd go out for uh, three days a week. I'd fly, you know, um, from here, go spend three days a week with him, come back here and then another, and then we had a, I think a full three week workup with um, any actors that were local to LA. So mm-hmm. Gerard and, and maybe a couple other guys and the whole, the core stunt team. Um, to get them all tuned up. And then we all, uh, so let's say I started with Butler in August ish. Um, but we all met everybody assembled, um, in Montreal to start that job. And from, uh, in like mid September, and I basically had about seven weeks before filming started with anybody else who turned up at that time, who was either Canadian or came from like Vincent Regan and, Tom, Tom came from the, came from England. Um, David Wenham was from Australia, and so all those guys showed up like with no, you know. And then I'm just sitting. I remember sitting in this office one day doing the intake take interviews, and because you see, like, okay, this guy's got to be a Spartan. I'm like, how? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got a long way. Yeah, and some of them would be like having to come up from like <laughs> super skinny dude yeah. to try and put you know, a little bit of size on, obviously you're not going to make anybody right. Arnold in that amount of time or not my objective anyway. But, um, but Vincent Regan was one of the dudes that, uh, um, who, uh, who played the captain in that movie and he showed up and I was just like, I went to Zach and I said, dude, I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do, but <laughs> man, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And Vincent went just, he fucking went all in total method. Uh, and, Lost, you know, 40 pounds in that period of time. Whoa. And Seven weeks, 40 pounds. Something like, yeah. Oh and, 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 and just kept going. And he, like, he could barely lift his body weight, you know, to, in a deadlift and then ended up with a double body weight deadlift. And, you know, something like, I think I watched him pull 305 one day wow. uh, with a blindfold on, which is an interesting thing we throw on people sometimes or doing Turkish get-ups with a blindfold on just to right. get rid of any visual reference things. Yeah. And then we had some incredible guys, local guys uh, on the stunt team that came from gymnastics or Cirque du Soleil background, right. and and I got to learn a thing or two from them. Sure. But so it was uh, sort of eight weeks and then have to try and hold guys in that condition. And that job, unfortunately, um, included a Christmas break. Right. Oh, 
Because it. it's sort of like mandatory. So like yeah. get all these guys in super good shape. We've done six weeks of filming and then everybody gets two weeks off. Yeah. You're like, please, Ugh. God, don't eat all the cake. So did you did you have input on not only their, their programming, but their diet as well? Oh, yeah. Were you controlling their... All of it, everything, everything. Because, because, oh, yeah. like, if you can't, if you, do, if for, on a job like that, if I can't control the, the 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 food part, then right, then the rest of it doesn't matter. You know, almost exclusively. Yeah. And so we had it for the for the um, stunt team and the actors. We had a fully separate kitchen than normal catering, and um, and at that time I was using the, a zone system. We had a three week yeah. rotating menu, and I'd just go in, design the design the blocks, and and uh, that everybody needed. And so before filming started in the prep period, we were at a sound stage where we had like three kitchen trucks outside and this guy, Luke, whose business I can't remember the name of, but, um, he was, he and I would interface all the time and he'd tell his people, you know, like, and so when the, the team would come, they'd just show up at eight o'clock in the morning, start the day, they'd get breakfast and then we'd break, everybody would get us, you know, a snack at, you know, their breakfast would be like, me. You know, because I was just trying to like strip away as much fat from from people, right. and some of these guys were doing a, a pretty incredible amount of work on um, on very few calories. But we also had uh, them, so they get they'd get the breakfast, they'd get a snack, we'd do lunch, an afternoon snack, and then they'd get a takeaway dinner if they wanted. Right, and and uh, if they did that, they could save their per diem. So all the stunt guys were on that kind of program. Got it. Um, and then we had. Uh, uh, also a, a chiropractor, masseuse, and every and, and physiotherapist, also located in that in, in that facility. Masseuse was there all the time. Um, the chiropractor and the physio would come twice a week, right? And uh, that guy was like the uh, let's see, Montreal Canadian. So he was a, the the team doctor for the the Canadians hockey team, right? Um, and uh, so as much as we could control, we do because like you control the environment, you control yeah. the output, right? And and if you the more we can uh, have those resources under our thumb, uh, the better. And then once we started filming and moved to the sound, the, the sound stage where everybody was, there were still two separate kitchens. They were just in the same fucking room. Which there has to be because crafty on set is just crap food. Yeah. And then I would always go sit um, whenever lunch happened. Um, you know, the Spartan sort of kitchen is over here and they could go sit. Once they got their food, they could go sit wherever they wanted. Right. And I would go sit over by the, the, the normal crew dessert table and just fucking glare at people all the time. Because <laughs> 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 like, somebody, somebody would go like they might, you know, uh, sneak some cake sneak some cake or something. They'd, I'd be like eating or reading or doing something and I'd, I, I sense a red cape or some <laughs> shit coming close and I'd look up and they'd be like... Damn it. <laughs> um, and, and it was, that was probably dietary wise and with it, with a team that big, cause there were full on, I mean, 30 full-time sort of Spartan and actors, and then an additional 10 or so that or 10 or 12 that kind of came later and fell into the same program, um, who were there for less time, but it was, but dietary wise, that was one that was super fun for me, just uh, cause I had really good resources to make the food right? and, you know, kind of carte blanche. It's actually just like, Hey, anybody's not doing their thing. Tell me. And we'll, you know, we'll threaten them in some way. Well, that's, and, that's interesting because you got to see design and implement diet for 30 people and their, and their programming. Yeah. So if you're using the zone at that time and you're designing their blocks, like, it, Explain to me kind of the, 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 your evolution and nutrition then from working with all these athletes. If you're, you're, I'm assuming that you're not using zone anymore or using aspects of it or not, not, not at all. Um, I mean, not anymore, but that period, I mean, that was in the, in the sort of CrossFit community that I was involved with at the time. Right. Um, you know, the zone was Sears was involved, you know, uh, Oh, was Sears involved in CrossFit? Yeah, in the, I didn't in the know beginning, that. I think you know, I'm I'm fairly certain he and Glassman had this uh, had a you know a a relationship. Got it. Um, and I had I'm, and I had been an early adopter of the Zone in '95 right. when like that book first came out. Yeah. Um, and and it worked like a it like if you want to shed weight and you respect the the the, the blocks and mm-hmm. you're in, you're for sure ending up on a calorie restricted diet right um if you're if you're doing an absolute 40 30 30 mm-hmm. thing 
And um, so when I started, I mean, I dropped probably 12 pounds really quickly because I had. Yeah, I'm sure you had 12 pounds to lose. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it was not a good look, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> but man, um, could I move fast? Uh, and, and I ended up on a conversation with uh, with Sears at the time and just saying, like, I, I go out in cold weather all the time. I'm always cold. And right. This, and he's just like, oh, well, I, I recommend that, you know, you increase the fat blocks. I'm like, well, that would be more than, a, you know, 40. So I went on the 40, 30, 200 diet. It was basically <laughs> like 200% of the normal recommended amount of fat. Right. And so as long as the, the, the protein to carb ratio worked and I could, I could inject as many calories in fat, not gain weight and go really long. And it, and right. it ended up being something that, that fueled a lot of what we did in the mountains, um, which, uh, uh, it was like this high fat content sort of driven stuff and then carbohydrates to, to, to um, in gel form or whatever to, to deal with right. the intensity part of it if we needed to. And, um, uh, but once I knew my way around the blocks, it was super easy to mm -hmm. tell the chef who's preparing everybody's meals, um, like here's the, the restrictions. Here's the left and right limits for what these each individual needs. Right. Um, and 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 I don't know it, how I could have done it otherwise with that many people. Got it. Um, and and uh, you know, as people saw, I mean, we weren't, you know, also I'm just like, okay, I, I need to strip away any fat. So these right. guys, if they're you know doing this much work, especially guys who are you know doing fight training all day plus their workout. Right. It's a huge amount of activity. Yeah. And some of those guys were, you know, eating 1500, 1800 calories a day. So of course they're just going to be just like shredded as yeah. fuck by the end of yeah. it. Um, and it's not, and you know, it's just like, okay, this isn't sustainable, but it's for a particular task and everybody's right. on board. Nobody wants to be the fucking Spartan with a muffin top. Yeah. It's right. imagery, not like, fitness. Yeah. Like you, you want exactly. an image. But well, there, but also there's a capability part to it, and and that's a, a a thing that a lot of people maybe don't understand about the film business is like, um, you the the more physically capable we can make the actors be, the less they need to be doubled, mm. right? Yeah. And 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 depending on the quality of the double, everybody like you can sense it as a viewer, you know something's wrong, mm -hmm. but you may not be able to say, oh, that's not. Yeah. That guy, that's not that guy. And it right. happened on a couple of, of later jobs where... And doubling's expensive. Um, it's For less expensive than CGI. Hmm. So, like, that's, that's you know, a, a later job where we missed the mark for a variety of reasons with a couple of people. It's just like, hmm. all right, we'll, tra you know, we're not going to get there with the actor, so we'll train the shit out of his double. Got it. And then they'll do... and and you know, the, the producers knew what was happening. They could right. see this actor's behavior. And so it's just so, a lack of discipline on the actor's part. Is oh, that yeah. like, they just wouldn't adopt the, the self delusion. Got it. You know, like he looked in the mirror and somehow he saw, you know, the, right. Michael Fassbender looking back at him, which was <laughs> not true. You know, like, <laughs> Sorry, buddy. yeah, far from it. I would, um, and so we missed, but then uh, this guy's uh, stunt double, Adam, was totally on board. Right. And so in that movie, there's a bunch of head replacement, but you know it. Like when it happens on screen, you can sense it. And and so Zach's thing in the beginning was like train the shit out of these guys on the original 300 right. to make them as capable as possible because we'll have Chad and Damon doing all this the fight training stuff to get them to be able to do as many of their own combat stunts mm -hmm. as, as, as possible. Um and therefore, like in the crazy horse charge or whatever, um, Butler is is doubled. Uh, he had a guy, a, a stunt double named Tim Connolly, who's a t total badass. And uh, um, they ended up not having to double him that much because they just trained him and trained him mm. and trained him. Like, okay, you're rehearsing this, you know, in isolation, these different blocks of this thing, and then starting to put it together. And pretty soon, you know practicing that whole charge five or six times a fucking day with the, the, the shield, the spears, the, 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 the spear and, the, and then the sword at the end. And that, um, like, so he got, uh, Butler got really capable in that and didn't end up mean not having to be doubled that much other scenes. Yes. Um, but, 
like the more capable we make them, the better mm. everything looks and the less it ultimately costs. Because like training people and controlling their diet is super cheap compared right. to as like, you know, doubling and CGI. Well, and so if you've worked, you've worked with like all these different types of people from, you know, climbers to special operations guys yeah. to actors. And so kind of, can you explain to me your process in in programming and nutrition now like how it's evolved and you know i I know i'm super interested in it and the fact that you you're still out there doing a ton of different things it seems like as far as like your cycling you've had you still have the gym you've got all these different things you've learned a lot yeah (laughs) i've learned how much i don't know (laughs) (laughs) you've learned way more than me and probably 99.9 percent of anybody out there in the process maybe about fitness stuff but walk doing a walk through here today uh, like being in the lab it's like oh this is Well, that's just coffee nerd shit. Okay, (laughs) here. It's just fitness nerd shit. Also, (laughs) like it's like it's because a lot of this stuff is universal in a way. And um, so with with the just the the dietary stuff, it's, I mean, I always had this idea like you, I mean, you is, uh, I mean, find the problem, fix the problem, which I think my old, uh, that simple gym trademarked, I think maybe now, but, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's simple. It's like, oh, you're too fat. Okay. I know how to, I know how to do that. Like I can, okay. You're too, you know, you're too skinny. You, uh, you don't have an athletic bone in your body. You know, like the, if these are the problems, the solutions are there Mm -hmm. and, and and people tend to overcomplicate stuff. You know, like I need the secret program. I'm like, fucking go for a walk, man. Right. Like, like (laughs) start there. And when you can jog a little bit, then maybe, you know, you don't need like the, fucking super top secret red envelope thing right. is it uh, um and so the main i mean i mean the stuff that uh it, it's a completely different problem where say for man of steel you know um henry cavill who played superman in that movie you know he came and he was light right you know he had just come off a job where I mean, he's six one and he had done this job call, uh, for a movie called Immortals and had gotten – they were just doing calisthenics and not – and, you know, eating fucking dirt, I think. Um, and uh, they didn't have, like, a trainer on that job. The guy who was the stunt coordinator was running the guys through this fitness stuff. And um, he got down – he was, like, weighed 170 pounds on that. Wow. I mean, if you look at him in that movie, he is lean and small. He did a movie called Cold Lighted Day right after that where he was on the pier and pizza diet. Right. And so, like – taking super lean 170 and then like strapping a rocket to the pendulum and sending him the other direction where it's like, you need to look like an out of shape, accidental, you know, a spy hero, whatever. Right. Dude. And, and he rolled up, uh, on the man of steel job and we're like, fuck. Okay. So we need to put size on, but it's gotta be good size. And we got to hold him. And, and the certain jobs will, will be, be different. If I've got a guy who is, you know, maybe got one or two shirtless days or something like that, that's super easy because the condition doesn't have to be stable. Got it. Like we can get there really quick. Right. Andrew Plevin on the 300 sequel, um, we took 30 pounds off him in five weeks uh, using intermittent fasting right. essentially and, and legit training uh, three hours a day, an hour and a half in the morning, hour and a half in the evening. And, uh, or sometimes two, like two hours and one hour, but legit actual physical activity on around between 11 and 1400 calories a day, um, eaten in this very specific window and fasting. And we were doing 19 five with him. So he'd fast for 19 hours, wake up, have a, you know, drink a black coffee or whatever, come to the gym, we'd train. And then his feeding window opened immediately after that. And so right. like eat all your food as fast as you can so that, um, you know, when you come back later for your second workout, um, it'll be digested. Got it. So that, so that, but he was only on, on camera. I think he had three filming days, so it didn't matter what happened afterwards. Right. Right. But Henry on that initial man of steel job, it was a 122 day shoot. So we had to keep him whatever condition he was in on, uh, August 1st, right. first day of filming. <clears throat> He had to be in the end of January. Like, we have to change your lifestyle. Yeah. And make you look like it. And you have to live it throughout this whole yeah. whole time. 
because there's no, like you can't go away at Christmas and do whatever the fuck you want and come back and think you have time to get into condition. Right. No, they, those cameras are rolling. You come back on Sunday, man, Monday morning, you know, cameras are rolling. So you've got to l- still look this way. And, um, and that was, that's really hard on someone to be that strict for that long. Yeah, especially somebody probably like an, like an actor that that's not their lifestyle. Like, I mean, that's easy for us to kind of, even if we fall backwards, I'm sure like, oh, well, uh, I remember what discipline is. Like, I know how to do this. Like, I can just like change my lifestyle and I understand the end state. But somebody who's like just been an actor probably just goes, why yeah, the I think, fuck I, am I doing this? But there's a, there's a funny thing about that because you do, because it's, it's easy to say, oh, I've just been an actor or whatever. Right. Like Henry was relatively unknown at the time. So he was willing to do whatever it took. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I also had Russell Crowe on that job and he needed to lose around 40 pounds. Right. But he's been doing it for a long time. You know, you know, he's been an actor for a long time. He's been, and he's a, you know, he's a stubborn, stubborn man. Right. And so, but I am too. And so we had a <laughs> contest. Like, it's like two mules and oh, a, a, just like beating each other up. Yes. Like, uh, like no, war, seeing whose ha- head is harder. We'll just like <laughs> smash our heads yeah. against each other and see whose is harder. And I think we, I think it was a draw in the end. Um, right. And, and I kind of missed the target with him on that, but he had just come off a, you know, really bad p- patch in his life. He, you know, was 40 pounds overweight. Right. And um, I needed to get him to lose that 40 pounds by mid-October when I got him. You know, I think we, I think he was shooting like t- tail end of October or something like that. Um, and it actually happened. We actually hit that mark, but later in the, year, November. <laughs> um, it, it, because it just, it, older guy couldn't handle the intensity. So we had to substitute volume for intensity. Right. So it's a lot of days out on the bike, you know, we're riding our bike six hours today. Got we're, it. you know, riding yeah. our bike six hours and then we're going to do some stuff in the gym right. kind of thing. So each of these jobs, you know, it's a, it's a different problem. And so a different dietary thing and a different workout thing, um, like for him, he was totally stoked when we first met. He said, you rode your bike into the gym and I, you pulled your helmet off. You have gray hair. And I was like, fuck, thank God. Because <laughs> at least he'll be someone, he won't be like young guy, you know, right. here who doesn't, you know, get the, doesn't understand the mileage on R- Russell's body after, you know, getting wrecked, doing stunts, right. playing rugby, you know, et cetera, getting yeah. fights and shit, um, you know, in, in his life. So. Uh, th- there's always working around that stuff or, you know, um, and then the flip side is it's also good. You got to give people work that they lo- that they enjoy doing. Right. Cause it can't just be miserable the whole L- time. Like maybe he doesn't like running at all. You're not going to just put him out on the track. Oh, fuck no. Cause he won't do the work. Well, no, he wouldn't. And, and, and then, uh, then he would be broken also. Yeah, right. yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> so like a, yeah. a bike is good or, Hey, let's go warm up and, you know, go up and he'll, you know, we'll do a little sort of rugby type thing during the warm up because there's a grass field outside the warehouse gym or whatever. Right. Um, so he d- digs that. He loved riding his bike. You know, so I was like, all right, well, that's what it's going to be. Got it. We got to do some other stuff, but we're, we're not fucking doing box jumps, man. <laughs> right. You know, that's, yeah. that's the other people are going to take care of that. And, yeah. uh, um, and then, or somebody like uh, Jason for the Justice League movie and then later Aquaman. I mean, he's super into rock climbing. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the way to manipulate the, you know, the Guinness consumption is like, <laughs> Hey, super- you cut back on the Guinness and, you know, we'll yeah. do, we'll do some, you know, I'll give you a weekend, or, you know, weekend in Fontainebleau or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like you can go over there, meet your family or go over there with some of the other dudes, go rock climbing for a couple of days, come back. And it's, so it's, it, it's, it's really, um, it, I, I misused the words you know, that I'm a sociopath when it comes to that. Right. Um, but I am a, pr- got to be a pretty good manipulator in the end. Sure. Sure. And with Henry and Superman and and then Batman versus Superman, just as yeah. like, what a tall, cool task you had to do. Like you had to build Superman. Like one right? of the most iconic <laughs> yeah. characters ever. And you got to build him. I had no idea he was so thin before. Like he is huge in those movies. So, the camera adds 10 pounds, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you want those to be good pounds. Right. right. Anyway. So like uh, on, uh, on, on the man of steel, we were, our, you know, Michael, my assistant, um, uh, and he and I 
um, have the nonprofit project together yeah. now. Um, so he was my assistant on that. And we, and our goal was like, we got to get him to 200 pounds. And there was one day he came into the gym and it was like, you know, how do you 199.2 pounds or something? And I was just like, dude, go, go drink a gallon of water, yeah. you know, a liter, a liter, a liter of water. Burrito. Get, we'll do it. Come back here, stand on scale. So we at least get a picture. But that was the only way we got him to, you know, to close to 200 on that. And it was, I mean, and people were like, well, what was he eating? What was his diet? And I'm like, all everything. everything. I mean, his post-workout shake would be, you know, fucking yogurt, heavy cream, protein powder, right. fruit, coconut milk. Like his post-workout shakes were legit 1400 calories. Whoa. Jesus and, and, uh, and, and then, a, you know, then a ton of other calories because yeah, yeah. you got to fuel it, not only for, for the recovery, but for the body to remodel you right. know, in an appropriate way. Also, that means that he needs to rest a fair amount. So he can't be, and uh, you, you know, can't just be like beating him down all the time. Cause here's someone we're trying to build up rather than strip down. And, um, uh, and then on, on Batman versus Superman. So for that movie, I was one-on-one -on -one with Gaul the whole time. So, you know, I started off like three and a half months in Tel Aviv with her living across, you know, in the little hotel her husband owned across the street from their house and trying to put weight on her. And then Michael was with, uh, Henry and Henry just was like, had this idea, look, I just want to get fucking huge. <laughs> and he did, but to the, but, but in a way that didn't, um, match aesthetically the first movie, right. like the first one. And, and when you say it's so cool to do that and like that job, fucking terrifying it. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. can I get like maybe Daredevil or some, yeah. you know, guy who's sort of normal whose physique doesn't really matter as much because that'd can be I have way easier. Spider Man, because he's like a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, he's done. Cool, you've got a, a adolescent boyfriend. I'm yeah. done here. Yeah, I'm done. Exactly. Yeah, you showed I'll up with it. Now. I'll just get paid, and you just do nothing. We'll just you hang just out. take different hard routes now. You're still yeah. like climbing fucking nasty shit. It's just different, right? It's, it's, I mean, some of those, <laughs> some of those jobs of pressure is like pretty, pretty fucked. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, you know, and yeah, at a certain point, like I would, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm well compensated for that work, but it's also, um, you know, I was, I was meant to, on that, on that Batman versus Superman, I was meant to be with Gaul for like two weeks in Tel Aviv. And then I get over there and sort of tail end of the, the two weeks and we're kind of ready to like, we're supposed to fly to Detroit. It's fucking mid January at that point. Right. And, um, where Michael and Henry are, they're stuck. Something happens and they have to push the movie by three months, which was great for me because Gaul would not have made it otherwise. Right. Um, to, and, uh, um, but that just meant like, Hey, you're staying there. I'm like, and, and I would set up these jobs where I'm just like, go to Zach and the producers and say, all right, who's the person, right. what condition are they in? What do they need to look like? What's the deadline? Give me all the resources that I need and leave me the fuck alone. Cause I always deliver. Right. But <laughs> being, uh, out there, I, and I say, you know, in that foxhole by myself for those three and a half months on what turned out to be probably the, I mean, at the time, the job that was the hardest that stressed me out more than any other job. Um, because it's like, okay, now I'm have to learn how to manipulate, you know, female psychology. Right. In a, in a, you know, um, and a girl who's, uh, I mean, lovely, lovely, wonderful girl, but who has been rewarded for her thinness, mm. whose social circle is also other models, Got it, yeah. you know, around. And, and so they're e reinforcing their, right. each other's sort of, you know, not eating program and, um, and to get her and to try and convince her to put on weight which is completely different like than just going to some dude and making him train with his shirt off in front of other people. Cause he's fat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause that's like, okay, fear and shame. Fine. Right. Everybody like on the original 300 movie, Works perfect. we started like nobody trains in this gym with their shirt on. Sorry. Sorry. And everybody, you know, Monday morning you had a heavy weekend. 
Yeah, we see it. <laughs> you know, like you're a little bit soft. Have those uh, beers taste. Logan said that yesterday. He's like, nothing <laughs> motivates me more than just filming myself when I'm sparring because he, whatever you said, he's like, yeah, I yeah. Just have just, to start doing you that. Get, you know, at least me, I'm just hypercritical of myself when I got to take that third person look at what I'm doing and yep. and learn from that and add a little bit of discipline to your regiment. So. It's super useful for me. I, I I think so too. I mean, and and but then with uh, on that job with, I mean, I was one on one with her, and so I couldn't really, you know, put her in it right that kind of situation. And um, that that was a really hard job. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a um, shitty place but, either way. Like Tel Aviv, just horrible. Yeah. Like I've. I spent a lot of time in Tel Aviv, okay. like running on the beach down there yep. and like, <laughs> man, that place is incredible, man. Like Israel blew my I, mind how cool that place was. Yeah. I mean, I'd been like in, uh, in 1990, I was down in a lot on the Red Sea yeah. for 10 days yeah. working on this movie, uh, French action movie. And we were there filming sky surfing and that was, uh, I mean, it's just super hot. I mean, June, like we went out to the Negev and it was like, you know, whatever, 45 degrees Celsius. Right. You're like, oh, Cook eggs on the ground. Fuck me. Do not take your shoes off. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, um, it, and, uh, and then when I went, and so that was my experience, but being, you know, I lived a couple of blocks from the beach when I was there for those three and a half months and, right. um, made it my mission to find the best hummus that I could. Oh yeah. Uh, I'd go to the, you know, down to the Carmel market, all this, like, like, yeah. I, and, and, and I used to go everywhere with a road bike and I'd have like mm-hmm. a, a, a road bike with couplers in the frame so I could take my bike anywhere. And I, right. I did one road ride there, I think, realized I'm going to fucking get killed. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to die. Yeah. yeah. And the only group rides I'd ever see, there was somebody, you know, with a truck behind yeah. them. Roads like, that were designed, yeah. you know, 2000 years ago for horse-drawn carts and now they have vehicles on them. Yeah, not road and, bike conducive. And no one's like expecting to see a cyclist. Dude, I, I no. thought that in Beirut when I was out running. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to get hit and killed. Like, this is not conducive to foot or bike traffic at yeah. all. No, especially, yeah. you know, like Tel Aviv is like so that, you know, the streets are small. People drive like fucking mania. Yep. Sidewalks and, are like you know, Then you got roads. like a random motorcycle like flying through there at like 60 miles an hour with some chick with an Uzi on her back, which is super <laughs> hot by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no problems there. <laughs> so one day I'm sitting, you know, on the little deck in front of my room or whatever at this hotel and I'm like here, start hearing some popping noises and I'm like, I know what that is that's super close. Like this is really wild. And then more popping noises doesn't get any louder. I'm just like, okay, that's, that sounds all pistol caliber. Okay. So I get on Twitter and I start looking at, you know, at the, at the news and within like 10 minutes, you know, that the, at the little shopping mall that was two or three blocks or whatever from where my hotel was, um, there was, you know, some guys rolled up on the, on their, you know, two up on a motorcycle yeah. and, you know, dumped a mag into the back of this car. It was like a gang thing, right. not a terrorist thing. And it's like, well, you don't really hear that every day or you don't, you know, get the newspaper and or whatever and read the English language. Oh, yeah, somebody, you know, dropped off a hand grenade at the local farmer's market right. in this little place. And um, like just interesting. But it ended up like I I didn't I, I bought them. I started mountain biking in Tel Aviv because or nearby there because yeah. I realized like, okay, at least out here it's safe. And then Gall introduced me to a couple of friends and they would take me to these cool places to get ride by a mountain car bike. on the mountain. Well, yeah. You, did you go to Jerusalem when you were there and spend any time One, there? I did not pay, spend any time, you know, oh, one day well. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, like I drove out the not main route mm-hmm. um, to get there. So you kind of come in from the Northwest, I guess. Yeah, like, uh, the, I, I want to say it's- uh, Haifa. No, not, not that far there. North, but- no. um not the four lane was in so you have the, the the defense on one side and the camp yeah, on the other gotcha. and you know they're kind of yeah. zipping rounds over and it was it was the one where the the more recent was it might have been 2012 at the part of the uh, the recent intifada or whatever it was yeah. you know there was a lot of sniping going on uh-huh. on the people getting killed and, and i was like i'm not really into driving around and 
conditions like that. <laughs> it wasn't going on when I was there. Right. But um, but the 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 brief amount of time that I'd spent in Jerusalem, I could I mean I didn't I could feel the icky tension. Yeah. Thing. Places like, like it's that just are, like, are, are weird whoa. where it's like not a like it's not a war going on, say like in, you know, driving around J Bad or, or Baghdad or wherever, or like there's actual fighting happening here all the time, but like I felt that in Beirut when I was there a couple of years ago. For like, sure, Beirut's like, weird. It's like like you're like at any yeah. moment like that guy could get pissed at that guy and call his family, and this could turn into a shit show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I love Jerusalem. It's like one of my favorite cities that I've ever lived in. It's one of my favorite cities. So you spent a fair amount of time. I did. Yeah, I, I, it's wow. amazing. Like it's wow. an amazing city, and. You know, and some of my fondest memories are like early morning runs in Jerusalem, especially on like Shabbat when the whole country, like everything's at a standstill. Like yeah. I could run down the middle of the road in a main city and there's no cars going in, in, anywhere. Holy and in God. Jerusalem, especially, right? So yeah. I could go out on a morning run on a Saturday and have all the streets to myself. Nobody runs out there. Like, you know, like, yeah. like they, they do, you'll see like another runner here and there, but it's just such a wild and cool place. And the, the old city was right there. So you could kind of work through all your like really big sandstone streets and just like, it's such a cool, it's, it's just, just amazingly cool environment. I'd run out to close to, uh, Bethlehem, which is, I forget, like 12 miles or whatever, right? I'd put in these fucking long runs. And like Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and just Israel and Beirut, that whole area is just so incredible to me because it's a little bit spicy. You know, it's a little bit dangerous. It's like a little spicy, but it's got that like kind of cool flavor. Like, Like you can... Like it's a little spicy, but if you walk one block, there's this really cool French restaurant. No and they serve shit. some awesome fucking wine Seriously. for cheap as shit. And you're yeah. like, that's where I'm going after <laughs> that's hours. That's where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if- Israeli women are some of the hottest women on the planet too. And at that point in my life, I mean, I've never stopped appreciating beautiful women. It's not something I just stopped and just yeah. like, at that point Doesn't in my life. Turn off. Yeah. yeah it's- it's an incredible place, and I, I can't even say enough about how fucking cool it is. It's not like you want to go. I mean, I would. I would go vacation there anytime. I mean, any, I, I was time. saying that about Beirut until this morning. Until yeah, yeah. until the fireworks until, factory until blew up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was telling Logan like I think the hotel I was staying at for those like three weeks was like five blocks from there. I'm like I've I've done runs down past that place. Right. <laughs> like, Man. Oh, what? I would be <laughs> so surprised if that was only fireworks in that building. I, I was Dude. gonna say it doesn't seem like a Dude, country that, like that. Needs fireworks. Nor do fireworks like it has do, or do that, that big specifically. Of a they don't do that fireworks. thing specifically. That, that thing. That's what we were talking about this Looks morning. Like a was like, pounder. oh, at least like at whoa, least. Yeah. buddy. At least did you see it? Just <laughs> incinerated that hotel next yeah. to it. Just turned it into like no. You that know, looked like like a gigantic. It really bomb. did. Like a really like, big bomb. I was, I was telling Logan. I was like, it would not surprise me if. A few high-ranking Hezbollah members were putting just something so together to die in that hotel. <laughs> <laughs> it <wouldn't> surprise me. <laughs> they it just came out a little later. I no, don't that, know. That truck bomb just went off all by itself. <laughs> yeah, Holy or shit. if Hezbollah was making munitions. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, in that, in that and factory. then somebody yeah. detonated. Yeah. So you touched yeah. on something I want to circle back to. You were talking about the differentiation between high caliber and, you know, pistol or subsonic ammo, which I think is an interesting fact, which I'll segue into. (laughs) When I read your book back in the day, and uh, I I think I've told Trevor and a few few people this, but, you know, hanging around with people that like to climb, hanging around with people that kind of like to spend a lot of time in the mountains. Yeah. um, Reading your books and reading some of your material, I was, it was like, well, this dude doesn't fit that template very well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and then you being a competitive shooter on top of that and, you know, discussing kind of competing. It, it's so interesting to me because back in the day, I remember reading this. And I was like, oh, so I don't have to just hang out with these hardcore anti-gun hippies. <laughs> if, yeah. if I want to go climbing, there are actually other people like, like me, me that do these types of things. So I don't have to feel like such a fucking weirdo 
but or, or defend yourself, or defend you know, d- defend myself, like yeah. a, yourself. You always be in this sort of um, strange social confrontation with, yeah. and and it's and. And the sad thing about it is just like it's assumptions made on the, you know, I want to like how many of my anti-gun, you know, formerly anti-gun friends are firearms owner in the last four right, months, yeah, yeah you know, or, all. you know, all or something like that. I mean, I have a good friend um, who, you know, was, he was uh, neither here nor there. Right. You know, he was, didn't own a firearm. He's a 50, low, early fifties, you know, man. And, um, and, uh, this everything kicked off a little while ago and he was like, Hey, what do I need? I'm like, Oh, well you Whoa. live in the great state of Washington. You're going to have to have, you got to have a waiting period. So you right. might want to get on this, you know? And, and, um, and now he's fully down the road. He sent me a text the other day. He's like, ah, guy, I want bike riding. You know, I get, did I go riding with, watch some dude get dropped on the front porch of this guy's house after, you know, like, and I'm like, Joe, how do you fucking like, now you're sensitized to this stuff. Cause yeah. you know, and he knows what, you know, three rounds of 45 ACP to the chest. He knows how to describe that in a right. text now. <laughs> I'm like, man, you're on the steep fucking learning curve. <laughs> um, but it was weird because there was a period of time, you know, once people found out that I was shooting, especially in the climbing community, that the relation, like you could sense like a different level of tension. And then Seriously. when people find out that like, oh, and I, yeah, we was at this trade show or something and he bent down and. I realized he was carrying a gun, you know, in the Salt Palace trade show or something. Yeah, and yeah. then it gets even weirder, you know, or they'd hug and people, my friends would come up and they'd wrap their arms around me. I'd always be checking my, right. you know, <laughs> <laughs> behind my right hip. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, exactly. So what, but what turned okay. you on to that back in the day? Because it seems like, and I've, I've wanted to ask you this question for a while, because it seems like to go from that subculture, that crowd, and then say, Hey, competitive pistol shooting. That sounds fucking super interesting to me. How do you even get it turned on to that? Total, um, total happenstance. Like I, I had not, I, I remember having a conversation with uh, my, uh, climb partner, Randy Ratcliffe. And at some point we were in Canada in the Canadian Rockies climbing and he was talking about firearms on like his maybe a family member or whatever had right. firearm or something. And, and he goes, and he was just read some statistic and he's just like, yeah, there's, you know, Something like there's two, you know, firearms for every man, woman, and child in the country, you know, numbers wise. And he goes, right. and Mark, you don't own one, and I don't own one, and so that means somebody has fifteen, right. you know, like. <laughs> and I go, man, that's yeah. so fucked. This that's yeah. really that's good. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm making up for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somebody's got to take up this line. I mean, yeah. um, and so it, it would. I think it would have been 1995. Uh, the early in the winter of 1995, I'd driven from, I was living here, driven up to Teton, to the Tetons to go uh, winter climbing. Conditions were shit. I mean, the weather was horrible. Right. And uh, my friend Brent's Hawks owned the Teton Rock Gym at the time. And he's a fucking cowboy. He grew up up there. He's right. a cowboy. And he's like, well, you can't go climbing. We should go. Do you want to go shoot guns? I was like, I <laughs> Climbers, I don't <laughs> shoot guns. <laughs> Who do you think I am? Did you have a neon onesie? Did you have a neon onesie on when you said that? Probably, <laughs> and like a, or at least a know, neon ponytail, you know, like. <laughs> and uh, so we go down to the uh, to the to the range and, uh, just outside of Jackson, and I was like, "Oh my god, this demands total focus." To like, here, have a firearm, you know, right. like all gun you know, and, and, uh, you know, there's a, the sign all you know, the four cardinal rules or whatever of this mm-hmm. and that I had, you know, a couple of guys who were watching me and I think I shot like a 44 Magnum revolver, like a six inch barrel right. on it. Um, a little Smith and Wesson semi-auto, something right. like that. I like within three days I was, I mean, I, okay, let's see. Just think about this. This is a, this is a trivia question. Mid nineties, new gun owner, want to be cool. What type? What yeah. type of gun? Yeah, just just imagine. Oh, Nineteen ninety five, uh, Desert Eagle. Okay, not that far. <laughs> 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 that's that's um that's buying a pistol while jerking off at the same time. I think <laughs> I wouldn't have known that at the time. Mid nineties, want to be cool. Okay, uh, I've got mine. You're gonna have to throw uh, yours out. Colt nineteen eleven. 
that not quite that cool. Mm. What was the Beretta that Mel Gibson was shooting in Lethal Weapon? Oh, oh shit! Good that call. Is, that good would be call. my. That guess. is a fucking really that, good call. That would have been. That's a, that would have been a good call. I feel like that would have been close. What about? Well, because okay, Magnum you're, you're, was eighties. That's a nineteen eleven. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe a revolver. No, I think an Mark, automatic. Mark's about efficiency, so I don't see you with a with a revolver. Okay. Okay. A, just think about a caliber that came and went in about six years. A caliber that came and went. In HK six USP years. forty. Let oh, me yeah, help there you we out. Go. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. So okay. There we go. Oh, there like, we go. You get a little <laughs> weird, but it's an automatic. Yeah. Automatic. Yeah. Th- you know, I think it was thirteen plus one or something. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, yeah. So. I buy one of those, get my, you know, normal capacity magazines that come right. with it, not realizing that we're in the middle of a high capacity mag ban, right. um, you, you know, in the state, like all kinds of shit went. R- and that, so w- then within a couple of months, I buy a SIG 226. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, because a uh, friend of mine, uh, a, 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 a guy used to guide a lot. His brother was working at the DA and slid me some... Uh, you know, before all the high cap mags had law enforcement only written on them, I got a few of those, right. not realizing, and I think I mentioned this when I was talking with uh, Jack about like controls on a USP, right, and a two two six are reversed, so decocking lever safety, like, yeah, okay, now I'm totally fucking up. Mm-hmm. I think I the next think about gun was a <laughs> next gun, I believe, was a Browning high power, um, and that was my gateway into the whole 1911 thing, got um. It. And because, and then I went to, uh, um, so I think I turned up with a with that two two six at a uh, USPSA competition mm-hmm. here in Salt Lake one, um, and just got your ass handed to oh, you. Oh, gee, well, no, for a variety. <laughs> of They're reasons, like, why do you have you know? a two stage trigger? Are you an idiot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 what is that I, a hinge trigger? <laughs> you <a> noob. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I yeah, highly recommend you pounds. just you just throw the first one away into the dirt <laughs> or throw it, and then you know like, throw the weapon at the target, you'll hit it faster. Yeah. Um and and, and the competition and I, I couldn't figure a way like i had to have a reason to do stuff yeah. like for me physical fitness was the end result was right. you know to support climbing um you know i need to be a figure out you know to, to be a better skier because getting to and from big roots in the alps you know it's a ski thing like so the only way i could think of shooting being uh yeah uh, ever useful was to and somebody goes oh there's these competitions and you could right. do these and i you know <laughs> Is that what drove you down like the reloading rabbit hole and like the whole oh, nine shit. yards? You're, of, like, you're reloading the whole nine. Oh yeah. Kind of like it went, um, and, and then, uh, so I started, uh, seeing Lisa and her, um, she had family here. Right. Her brother, uh, Dave is a, you know, he shot on the super squad and you, you know, with Barnhart, with Robbie Latham, with oh, Brian yeah. Enos and all those guys. Oh, wow. He earned his grandmaster with no a single shit. stack 1911 back in the day. That is legit. Re- and so I had the first match I ever went to here in Salt Lake, which was up at the now closed uh, range in immigration mm-hmm. or in, on the, not immigration, but the part in Parley's. Yeah, Parley's. Yeah. Parley's um, yeah. And I noticed, a, and one of the guys who was there, was kind of an older guy. Um, and, and it said, and he had like a, a beautiful hand tooled like cowboy style belt, right. like his inner belt, and it said Beauchard on the back. And I remember seeing that name because that guy just fucking lit. And it was him and uh, and the two Waki brothers, Matt and I can't remember his brother's name. And those guys were, I think they were shooting open guns at that point. Um, so thirty eight super, yeah, uh, with a um, and it was uh, either you know. Original Gigantor red dots, like yeah. they were like that big on top of like, a, <laughs> yeah. you know, like it was before yeah. um, the C, the original Seymours, right? Um, but they were legit fast, yeah. And so I remember seeing that guy, and then um, so that would have been in, in the summer of '95 when I shot my first competition, and then uh, I met Lisa, and then we came back out here and uh, on a, on a visit once, and I went to a, a match with him fully introduced. Right. And then I was just like, I need to learn all this stuff. And uh, she goes, oh, well, I know this other guy that they shoot with who's on the super squad and uh, we can just drop by his place in Montrose on the way back to Boulder because that's where Lisa and I were staying, we were living at the time. And so on the way through Montrose, uh, turn up at the range there and meet Ron Avery and spent two days shooting with him. 
And so, and this was when I started learning, and I had already learned how expensive it was to right. buy, you know, go to Sportsman's Warehouse and buy yeah. bullets. Like you don't shoot right. that much. No. And um, and then at that range in Montrose, that's when I met Brian Enos, um, because he was just same thing passing yeah. through. Coincidentally, Lisa knew him also, also from that whole because she used to go to matches with her brother. Right. And um, so she knew all the hitters, and I just kind of got like. Like introduced into that group, into the top of the circle, into the yeah. fucking legends, into the, into the legends. <laughs> yeah. Well, having to like work yeah. my way, you know, like I'm a I'm a D class shooter, but I <laughs> this, you know, this, hey, you my, can't you can't purchase access. And no, like, you can't to have access Seriously. like that, and then the desire to learn it. Yeah, and that I think was what everyone saw re- saw was yeah. like I'm uh, I come with an empty cup, and I will do like if you tell me, yeah, you know, some drills to do or things to work on, I will do it. Or like, okay, get rid of this. You, you okay? You need a 1911, you know, you um, or, or whatever, and yeah. and uh, and it wasn't too long thereafter that uh, I realized I probably need a high cap gun, and I ended up down at Brian's place in a, where he, when he was living in Apache Junction at the time, and so I was sleeping in his trailer and going out to his shed every day, and he helped me build a, um, you know, I started with a, a stock okay. STI at 40 and we right. did all the work on the grip and, and, uh, lightening everything that could be lightened yeah, and yeah. tuning it up and build, dial in a load for it. And, um, and, uh, eventually I got away from that, went back to single stack cause I, I realized like, okay, okay. I'm like, I'm the gear yeah. guy and it's, I'm just going to end up with one of those <clears throat> guns that's super fucking loud and holds 30 rounds you know and then um and 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 that lucked into you know i'd go down and shoot with with brian i'd meet robbie i'd meet you know all the guys who from that phoenix tempe zone who i mean it was the it's the the heavyweights of the uspsa and uh, at the time and um and then like and then uh, uh, Robbie was actually who introduced me to uh, guy. He was doing all the handgun stuff for guys at, behind the fence at Bragg, and right. he was the one who introduced me there yeah. in 1999. And that was like, and to be, you know, I don't have to prove myself as a climber or like to right. get introduced through that that door, and then go back and spend five days behind the fence and go to the range and be able to hold my own. That's fucking crazy. And then that was like. Everybody realized he's not that hippie right. guy with, he comes with the hack, you know, half key sack and some devil sticks or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, hey man, well, what, and what, because, because that, what are those, what are yeah. those things that the hippies always use? The, 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 yeah, those are devil sticks. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Let's sling some lead and play some hack key sack. But like, <laughs> those, convers- those conversations. We got to continue to be resourced appropriately for this next fight especially with our international partners in a combined environment. We can't do that over email and, and teleconferences. They have to be here, we have to fly with them uh, to build those lessons learned so that we can provide that to the next, not exercise, uh, the next operation uh, in a joint combined environment. Just do go on. I, we talked about it like when we drove out to go shoot in the desert, you yeah. know, like a few months back, like, those conversations go on when, when we all go to courses, if somebody has been there before and you know, whoever's running the course, like the instructor is not in the military has never been in the military, right. but you know, for a fact that they are a good shooter or they hunt or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. in that spectrum. It's like, yeah. no, no, they're cool. Cause X right. it's an immediate validation and nobody worries about vetting you. Like it yeah. just doesn't yeah. happen in the back of your head. And then that makes your job easier as an instructor. Cause nobody's sitting there like, all right, sure, dude, you hippie. Like, nobody's right. playing that game because you're vetted in their head. And, and you don't have to, and I wouldn't have to, like, pr- do some uh, stupid fitness thing, right. you know, like, invent to, to some prove your little worth. exercise that no one else can like do, but I've been practicing trick. for five fucking years. Yeah. Yeah. Look like you a know, juggle and exactly do a one-arm yeah. pull-up. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Or now I can, I can shoot the plate rack and play hacky sack at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah. you know, laughs> <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Uh, um but but that uh, yeah the the validation was like it it helped so much or I'd right. show up you know anywhere w- on, on a military thing and then like hey we're gonna go do this and then right. okay oh I know I know I understand I know this platform and 
I'd get the rifle and I could yeah. da, 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 you know, do the thing. And, and it, <laughs> it's so interesting to me though, because you have this, you have a subculture within the tactics world that is kind of the pseudo mountain hippie type of person. Oh yeah. That gets drawn into the tactical world. And I was always within that yeah. subculture of people because you know, people knew, okay, well, when Evan's off, you know, I'm running a river, I'm doing yeah. something that's that's outdoor based. And typically it's going to be something fairly complex that n- you, you can't do. Actually, it takes logistics, yeah. it takes planning, it takes skill. But, you know, I'd show up to places all the time, right? Where you'd, you'd be wearing Birkenstocks and dudes are wearing boots and they'd be like, what the fuck are you wearing? Yeah. Like, I'm going to fucking crush your nuts today on the range. And I'm going to, I'm going to bend you over and spank you like a fucking baby. I'm going to take your lunch money. And then you're, <laughs> then we're going to talk about my Birkin stocks later yeah. because you're going to get your ass kicked by these things. But one of my good friends, this dude is a fucking phenomenal shooter. Amazing guy. He's, he's incredible. Uh, he's actually the guy that the Aries watch. He's the guy that founded this company, okay. Matt Graham. And he shows up to this course that I was in and I knew instantly we were going to be fucking buddies because he shows up driving a Saab station wagon. Safety gets out first. In a, in, a, in a fucking <laughs> Hawaiian shirt, like buttoned down halfway down his like... Like, like pre, yeah. pre-cool Hawaiian shirt. No, no, no. Yeah, pre... No, no, no. This is pre... This, like, this is like post Magnum PI. On, like who gives pre a cool Hawaiian shirt, Birkenstocks and some like corduroy <laughs> shorts or some shit. Look, you know you're and, legit if you have corduroy shorts. Yeah. And he like swaps his shoes out because he's going to the range. I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna dig this dude. <laughs> this guy's my people, man. I like you already. Tribe. I like you already, bud. It, it's funny though, because like I think it's way easier to like if if you go into the the you know the the, the tactical world, right, let's call yeah. it, coming from a climbing background, like a, a civilian problem solving background where you've been in situations where the t- you know, the decisions that you make while climbing affect your, you know, well-being, right. Right. let's say, and it can, can in, a, in, a, in a very serious way. Like, I think you have a ton of advantages going into the tactical world, especially if you've, like, you know, spent, you know, kind of, yeah, I'm going into the mountains for five days, and I have to look mm-hmm. after myself, and I have to, you know, look ahead, you know, predict far enough ahead that I'm still viable on day five. I can't, like, just ruin myself these first few days right. um, and then come up short on the day. Um, I think that's a... a like one of the better backgrounds that you could have. And in, when I first started working with the teams and would go out to Pickle Meadows or the Mountain Warfare Training Center and, and work with guys, and I'm just like, look, I, I, I would r- rather teach a person tactics, you know, the guy who had a solid background in the mountains tactics than try and teach someone who came from the city and yeah. had a solid tactical background to move around the mountains. Yeah. Like I, th- there's... A, a layer of like, or a, a level of autonomy that you get from looking after yourself out in mm-hmm. the out in the wild that I think is super valuable. Well, and there's a layer of caution built in that isn't, yeah, that isn't stuck inside of anxiety either. Like somebody that's never moved around like that is going to be anxious. Yep. Whether or not they're cautious, but somebody that has done it is going to be cautious and probably not anxious. And I think your decision making is different. And I think also you you spend like if 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 it's an uncomfortable environmental situation, mm-hmm. the amount of energy that you th- that is spent just trying to um, like do your daily hygiene stuff, yeah. you know, just like okay, I need to look after myself. I need to okay, these socks that they're wet, I need to take them off. I got to put them inside my puffy coat tonight when I'm right. you know when I'm sitting here shivering to try and dry them out. So I've you know like all of those things that are automatic if you've done it enough, yeah, um, cost a lot. And, and and just moving around on on the on technical terrain and really guys you know watching uh, how hard people have to concentrate about foot placement and stuff like that and you're like yeah you're you're you know you sensitized you got your head on a swivel for an hour here in you know the first hour into this two day exercise but after that you're just looking at the ground all the time and you're super easy to run up on um, but the but and 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 then the the, the whole switch from like heavy boots to very lightweight shoes and then back to a midweight boot. I'm just like 
trying to teach all the time. Like there are places to save weight. Right. Footwear is not one of them in technical <laughs> terrain. Like because right, boots sure. are tools. Yeah. Like if I don't have to think about rolling my ankle, if I don't have to think about, you know, like like I've got a good, decent amount of protection underfoot, which I don't have in my super lightweight ultras that I right. lightened further by taking the rock guards out of, you know, like th- there, I, um, I, I've saved a bunch of energy by adding a little bit of weight to my, to my feet. Well, guys right. don't see that third order effect unless they've been affected by it. Yeah. Well, and you feel the consequences for poor decision making and the second and third order effects of poor decision making because of that. Right. So yeah. you, you know, you, pack your gear you plan your fucking routes or whatever it is and then you get in the middle there you're, you're not turning back like you're like fuck i i, I have Oops. fucked up so badly <laughs> that this yeah. is going to be so much more difficult I am going and to be i'm going to feel this every minute for the next how until yeah. this fucking ends and then you're like i will never make that mistake yeah. again yeah so until you make it again. You try it. You try it a little yeah. different. What if, what if I just do this instead? But it's the, it's the, the, little. the worst lesson <laughs> is the one that you is re-experiencing the one you already learned. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Fuck, I completely. Yeah. I did this before. Oh, exactly. Shh. <laughs> like, don't, <laughs> tell, <laughs> like, don't admit it. But, it, yeah, but it's true. No one. And, and one of the things like climbing a lot of times, I mean, the, the, if you come up to that point, the oops moment, right? When you're past the point of no return, then you, like you said, look, I'm going to be experienced. You know, I now I have to fail upwards because there is no going back. Well, going. like you were saying and on the talking about the Slovak track, like, yeah, we're taking this much gear and food because that's literally how much we're going to have. And if we're not done, then we're fucking done. Like, if we're going to make a mistake, it's made ahead of time. Yes, and and <clears throat> and but also. Sometimes those decisions get made without knowing yeah. exactly what you're getting into. Right. Yeah. Like I didn't realize, I mean, it never occurred to me like, cause I, you know, I don't, I, I'm not trying to not necessarily trying to get to a point of no return. Right. But once you do the liberating, like the, the sense of liberation is fucking amazing. Just yeah. like, because up until the point you can go down, you're always got that war gaming in your head mm-hmm. of like, okay, if we have to bail from here, this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, we're going to use these natural anchors. We can probably get V threads in that one spot, you know, or whatever, or I think we can get off to the side. But as soon as there's like no going down and no escaping to the left or right, man, all energy is po- aimed upwards on right. that outcome, yeah. which like, but you can't launch that. What Like there's no way without if there's a way back then then there is then i think it's impossible you, everybody who has their survival you know in their head always keeps something in their back pocket yeah but if there's no way if there is no you know no way down no like i'm not going to need anything extra i need to spend a hundred percent in that direction then uh then then you are absolutely free with with no, you know, if we're going to empty the tank and then we're going to lick it. <laughs> <laughs> Get that last yeah. drop out of there. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about this last week when one of the reasons I loved whitewater kayaking for for that reason was there was no turning around. There was, you, you just had to deal with your shit. And you don't like it, the river you don't, don't care. It doesn't fucking matter, man. Yeah. Like, you, you can portage kind of sometimes maybe depending if, if right? you can eddy out if you can but most of the time it's like you just gotta go well, and shit, you gotta you I gotta mean, work your way through it and you gotta just deal with whatever fucking comes your direction and every one of these decisions is like split decision making complex problem solving and, they're and compound- it's all fucking happening and they're to compounding you, and you can't you can't stop it it's 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 like a fight but it, you just can't stop it it's fucking it's taking you whether you like it or not you're going and I love that. So you better like it. I loved that aspect of things because it's, it's, you can control the entry and you can kind of control the out, but 
you know, it's a how, you know, how, how you've trained prior to the, the entire fucking process. What type of gear do you have? The gear is relatively limited to what type of training you're doing, what type of process you're moving through, mm-hmm. which I love the way the military actually teaches people how to train at times because yeah. the crawl, walk, run aspect of things. But I see a lot of military guys at times where they're, they're, really uh they're 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 stepping with trepidation trying to get into the run phase and it's like no man you got to fucking send it it's time to put your big boy pants on and just deal with your shit because yeah you crawled and walked already it's man it's time to go like it's time to time to get the fuck out and let's yeah. do this i think I mean, you're so much more efficient <clears throat> as a human when you don't have that thing in your back pocket whether yeah. it's going through a school or on a journey or adventure or a climb like if if there's only one option you're not going to waste any energy on on something else. But the day that you need that thing in your back pocket, mm-hmm. it's really nice to have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I, I and I. It's yeah. funny because I remember that there was a um a uh, story when um Mug Stump and Paul Aubrey did the you know what was. The first ascent of the uh, North Buttress of Mount Hunter to the top of the buttress, but not to the top of Mount Hunter. And it's a 4,000 foot thing and arguably um, not quite as steep as El Cap, but right. you know, it's a big, big wall of well, mixed, and, you know. For the audience, where is it located? Uh, it's in, it's, that is in the Alaska Range. It'd be the, I think that, uh, so right there with Mount McKinley and Mount Foraker, yeah. or Denali and Foraker. It's and an um, angry place. And guys have been looking at this for a long time. I'd, fr- some friends of mine from the Northwest had, you know, been up on the North Buttress. I mean, this was a, a, a an objective for a long time. And, and he went up there with Paul Aubrey and Muggs was, you know, noted for not bringing a ton of food. Right. You know, just <laughs> like, you know, cause he was known. <laughs> I'll just yeah. eat air. And, and, uh, and, and Aubrey, I remember there was like a thing, like he handed, he, there was in the article that came out afterwards, he was just like, um, because Muggs was doing the lion's share of the hard climbing and leading because he was that much better than pretty much everybody else on the planet at the time. Um, and Paul Aubrey was, I, I think, was it, it, in, in the article said something about like handing Muggs the last tiger's milk bar or something like, I can't have him running out of energy up here because <laughs> understanding full well that, you know, Muggs was, you know, shouldering more of the the, the load. And uh, I realized like, okay, that's, I, I'm going to have a fucking tiger's milk bar in the bottom of my packet, you know, or something, right. something, or whatever the equivalent of that is, because on the day, like, man, we need to, somebody needs to be making some good decisions here and we're all too stupid from, you know, lack of food. I mean, you get really, really sharp on a certain amount of hunger. Right. But then that goes away <laughs> <laughs> on a little more hunger. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't um, take much. And, and fatigue. Yeah. I can't imagine like, when you're talking about 40 plus hours of constant moving and that type of energy output, were you, were you, were you starting to uh, hallucinate at all at that point? Had you already been? <laughs> well, sorry. So the flashbacks Nixon promised yeah. me. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> were you hallucinating uh, from internal lack of sleep? I should say yeah, I'll preface I mean, that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, essentially the, um, I was, I never had like sort of visual type hallucinating. A lot right. of, except in the Himalayas, and that's more related to hypoxia than fatigue. Got it. But if you're, you know, say at 25,000 feet and you've been there for a while without oxygen you've, or 26 or whatever, right. um, there's the, the third man, you know, kind of thing is totally real. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, start talking to him. Yeah. Uh, some, you know, or, or it's the shadow, the feeling, the, you know, whatever. But, um, uh, the, but Scott and I would, uh, would get, uh, a couple of different times. We got just pretty serious auditory hallucinations. Mm. Like, um, and the joke was always came from, there was a, something sampled. I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a, a skinny puppy track, I think called stairs and flowers, <laughs> um, that, uh, the, the, this things that sampled from this movie. And they're like, do you hear that? Do you hear that music? That band. And, and 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 I don't know what the situation was in the movie, but it would always be in the fucking stove. Like we're stopped somewhere sitting on a ledge <laughs> and melting snow or ice to get something to water and there would be fucking voices or music coming from the stove. And so that was that was kind of the joke. I mean, and, and you every this there, there is a period when the the 
all the sort of expectations or prejudice or whatever goes away from fatigue right. and hunger. And there's a, and there's a, a mental clarity that comes from that, uh, that initial hunger, the, the under, you know, because there's, I don't have any blood, in, there's nothing, no food in my stomach to digest. There hasn't been for a long time. Right. So all of that is available, you know, here and, 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 but then you get, uh, and, and I, I, and we've, I felt like up to 24, maybe 36 hours, you're pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. You start getting real fucking stupid right around 36. Right. And on that particular route on the Slovak direct, right. It was right around in that time frame, 34 to 36 hours where we had a route finding. I had a route finding decision to make and take, find a way that's not too difficult through this rock band that was above us. And I was fucking too stupid. And I think we made two different <laughs> Uh, attempts through this rock band before finally like doing the end run around it, um, which is where we should have gone in the first place. And, uh, um, and then up a little bit higher, uh, Steve made a, a, a decision and this is like, then we're like at 55 hours in at this point or something right. like that, where we could have continued directly up the casino onto this, you know, up this known terrain following tracks from, uh, Mark Westman and his partner that had like, we had, our, the route that we were on had joined them and they were, you know, a high, far enough above us that we couldn't catch them. Um, and, but not so far ahead that the tracks that they had, you know, the boot pack that they'd put in right. on the ridge was getting filled in. So we had every advantage there. And Steve was just like, he saw the, he knew that we had to traverse off um, to head to, to uh, join the normal route and get down um, and just headed that way. And I, I remember, uh, at some point, um, all, you know, I was right behind him. Scott was uh, a little bit further back and we, uh, Steve stopped. I caught him, Scott caught up and, and I said something like, man, I don't know why we're over here. I don't know. I don't, there's no reason we should be here. And I think Scott said something like, I can think of 60 reasons why we're over here, which is every fucking hour essentially <laughs> that had gone into it. It's like, yep, it's true. We're real stupid right now. You son and, of a bitch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, leave it to Scott to come up with the, you know, the, the wisdom bomb in the, mo in that moment. Um, so, so I think up to a certain point, there's, there, you know, good decisions are made. And then after that, you have to build, uh, either watching each other right. type of safety features into the team relationship, um, or, or other mechanisms in to look after, cause you know, you're going to make stupid choices. I can't even imagine like, like working your way through climbing partners over that course of time because the people that match your personality in the sense of who's this person that I will actually not want to fucking murder after a few few hours actually has the endurance and capacity in order to bring value to the team like I, I can't imagine how many arguments have you gotten on in fucking amounts <laughs> 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 to be like I, I think about that history and I'm like oh my god man how many how many fucking slippers did you have to put on before you found some Cinderella's in that thing Fuck. Um, <laughs> not a lot. I mean, there's, there's a, like the, the, that, the, I guess the available number of partners who right. are on a, like a, a similar level, technical ability, vision, et cetera. Limits are, your pool. Uh, limits the pool already. Right. But also the, the, um, the, who is the partner, who's the right one for who I am as a climber and what I want to do like right now. Right. And it can't, later it got a little bit mercenary, but like, um, when Randy Ratcliffe and I went to the Canadian Rockies and we both spent a lot of time in the French Alps soloing. Right. Um, and we both loved climbing frozen waterfalls without the rope. And it like our overlap at that time was completely consistent. And, and he had no, he had no ambitions to go to the Himalayas though. Right. Which is where I was like he, aiming. He just liked hard ice. He, yeah. Or, or hard Alpine routes of, you know, in the three or 4,000 foot, you know, and he'd soloed a bunch of hard rock routes in the Alps as well. Um, but things he could get out and do in a day, maybe one bivy, something like that. And, and that didn't require a ton of logistics right. Right, just to get out and move. And so that trip um, to the Canadian Rockies where, you know, our last, the last five days we were there, 
Um, we simul solo Polar Circus, which is a 600 meter, you know, I think grade five plus frozen waterfall. Um, and then we took a rest day and then we simul solo Slipstream, um, where my, he got a little bit behind on that. It's my, where my speed record on that. And that's, a, I think it, I think they call it 925 meters. So 3000 vertical foot frozen waterfall, um, grade four technical thing, but super dangerous from objective hazard. And then took another rest day and then did the first ascent of the reality bath. Another 600 meter frozen waterfall. We called it grade seven, um, but it's probably technical grade six, six plus, and an engagement grade of seven because it's got this gigantic Serac over the top of it. Um, and that's fucking 1988, and, not, and that route still hasn't been repeated. Wow. Um, but we overlapped perfectly right. for where we each were at that time. Um, and on that trip, I met Barry Blanchard. Um, who was my partner for the next little bit and and vice versa, because he had been to the Himalayas. They had money to go back. Got it. For right. They had lost the third man of their, or the fourth guy of their four man team. Right. So they invited me and I was just like, okay, this is fucking perfect. Everybody on that team, him, Ward Robinson, Kevin Doyle, all guys, you know, ton of experience, all guys had soloed a lot. Um, and that right there for me is the thing. If you've only ever climbed with the rope, uh, at least for me at that time, I was just like, well, I don't really, I like to make up time. Right. <laughs> you can cover, you know, if you take the rope off, you can cover and, you know, just don't fuck up. Right. Um, and you can cover a lot of ground that way. <laughs> I think you said so, that about those routes in the in the Rockies uh, <laughs> that, that you did with him. Like, I mean, you guys could repeat it if you're willing to take the objective hazard of climbing alone. Did yeah. You, like yeah. if you could, if you don't fall. Did you go through that? Did you go through a phase where you, you just didn't give a fuck? Like, I mean, in order to do that, it seems like there's got to be a psychology of if I may, if I make a mistake, I'm dead, but keeps okay. You, keeps you sharp. Yeah. I mean, th- 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 I don't know how it, that started for me. I mean, I wasn't, I'm, I'm not, antisocial by nature, but I'm also very, yeah, I I didn't look at it philosophically in the beginning. It was just Mm. like, okay, I don't have a partner for the day. And I'm, and I, I know that this makes me more capable. It's just like, yeah, you can, um, I mean, I always kind of joked or there was a period of time where I was just like, yeah, I mean, I don't, Dojo, you should just train with a live blade. Right. (laughs) You, you know, know, or totally fine. The, totally, like, <laughs> totally I mean, that stable. would, I guess that would be the equivalent. I don't right. know, but it's what right. I would like. I don't want to speak out of turn for you, but I'm sure that kayaking alone is similar. We're like, oh, I, I don't, I think combat's probably more appropriate yeah. because well, they're, they're like, you have to have a level of commitment. I know, like, after you figure out, like, okay, well, drowning's not that bad. Like, if you're just going to go to sleep, basically. Because I remember the first time very acutely, like I was pinned underwater. I was like, oh, this won't be that bad. So, <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, yeah. I guess, but I, I've had like this. two. I, I'm good with this. Like, mm. I didn't want to, obviously. I was yeah. trying to get out. But I'm like, okay. Guess well, this that, is it. That, ain't, that ain't that bad. Fucking mm. ain't, man. Like, you know, but I mean, you're like 18 or 19. Like, it's not like you have a conscious, coherent, developed thought. You don't even have the capacity. About how barely, fragile what this is. You don't understand yeah. how important it is. You know, I don't know if I actually understood that until well into my 30s because, you know, there were days where you're just like, who gives a fuck? You know, later in life, right? It's just, you know, you cruise around and, hey, let's try to get into Sodder City for fun. Like, we don't really need any real information. Maybe we go pick a fight. Fuck it. Let's get it on. You know, I I mean, that, but that's where. Yeah. So the interesting thing there is, I mean, for me, um, where, where I would say, and it's not, you know, better or worse, but wh- the thing about climbing is that, that, but the, the, sh- when stuff goes like you're making these decisions in a relatively slow way, right? Like you're confronted with certain risks and you're like, man, okay, I think we can, I think I can get away with this or right. I'm sure I can get away with it. You know, if mm-hmm. everything is as it appears, I can do, you know, this. And that could, right. that could be, you know, looking at a route. A three thousand foot roof in the bottom that could be relating to the next ten feet, right? Right, but but nothing, you know, if 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 unless you think um, the mountain is sentient, 
Mm-hmm. There is nothing hunting you. Yeah. Like all of these things are yeah. like, it's a, yeah, it's, it, it, it could be, you know, short straw day, you know, mm-hmm. for the, the, um, but I will never let it happen due to inattention. Right. I will never let it happen because like, because it wasn't ever, I don't give a fuck. It's mm. like, to me, it was always, I'm willing. This is, this is worth it. I will, right. I will risk this. And for that, the for, end for state that. is worth right. the risk. The, for, yeah, that exactly. And, and yeah. to find a partner who's on the same page, that's not simple. No. Because someone who's re- total relationship <laughs> with life and or death is, you know, I mean, when Randy and I went up on Slipstream or whatever, and I just started running, um, essentially, you know, we're both like, well, it's, just not that great anyway right. to be a lot, you know. So that makes sense <laughs> because you know it's so pretty shitty. So we're, we're, the bang. But we're free. Yeah, you know, I mean, we we right. are therefore completely free. But then confronted with, do I? You know, I just swung this ice tool. It didn't give me the super warm fuzzy sound back. You know, yeah. if I didn't give a fuck, I'd just pull and gotcha. you know hope for the best. Right. But because I give a fuck, you do give a fuck. I, right? I'm gonna you know. Uh, replace it solidly so that if my feet blow or something bad happens, then I have that, that but, particular But point. it's interesting because I think I'm just trying to understand in the sense of you have to physically and psychologically acclimate yourself to, to that through like so many forms of repetition and push yourself past what most people can't comprehend yeah. as far as the, the the individual psychology is not something that I don't think most people can actually break through that threshold. But the shocking thing is how plastic the mind is right. in that way, that, yeah. that, that repeated stress. Because I would say the same thing Habituation. about, you know, combat. Like if you say, hey, let's go into Satter City and pick a fight, I'm just like... Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't... Um, and, and, you know, I'd like to, all dudes would like to believe that, you know, put in that situation that they would man up. But uh, all, but the only way that could happen is through a stress inoculation sort of process. And it's right. the same thing in climbing. And it's not, um, and you can, you can kind of think in your head like, um, yeah, I'll solo a 30 foot route first and then a hundred foot route. And I'm like, once you're 30 feet off the deck, it doesn't matter because right, you're yeah. dead. You know, you only, yeah. like, if you lob off in an uncontrolled manner from 30 right. feet up, you know, the outcome is the same. same. There's just more of you to recover than if you <laughs> fucking tomahawk down a 2,000 foot. I mean, I, 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 um, much. climbing partner, Philippe, uh, when he got killed, he went 700 meters. Right. Um uh, of not like in the air, you yeah. know, vertical limit style right. of whatever. But, um, uh, I later had a, I mean, it was pretty fucked up when they recovered him. And, um, a couple of years later, I actually, uh, had a long conversation with his mom and she had recovered this pullover he was wearing when he took that ride and had stitched up, you know, the, like had washed it didn't get all the blood out, stitched up the hole so she had something mm-hmm. of him right. left. And I was like, man, you get fucked up when you fall, you know, when you cartwheel that far. Right. Yeah, we're, and, not, um, we're real fragile and hit, yeah. hitting things fast is not good for humans. Jeez. And, and, but, but, but there's a, the, 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 trick, the mental trickery of thinking that, you know, 30 feet is any different than, you know, 300. <laughs> right. Um, it is, I mean, you can, you know, fucking get in a little altercation in front of the brew pub and hit your head on the curb and be just as dead. Yeah, so, right. um, but, but going through like a process of, of that inoculation, like, oh, I'm comfortable on this grade of rock climbing. Right. I mean, super comfortable. So I can just, you know, paddle mm-hmm. in a way. Uh, and I'm, I bet it's the same in the river. And the difference there is that the, you are in a moving, a very dynamic environment. Um, whereas the ideally the mountain's not moving. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, uh, <laughs> please don't go nowhere. I think, uh, we have bigger problems now is, um, <laughs> is the line that is supposed to be. It is a super short straw. You yeah. pulled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fuck. So I, I was cruising through some of your stuff. And one of the things I was watching today in, 
it, it the videos looked kind of lame, so don't hold me to this. But like the place fascinates me. Antarctica fascinates me. But I mean, how what, the video looked kind of that was put together yeah. it looked super cool but it was too fast there wasn't enough depth to it for me i was like man what the fuck did you guys do just like go down there and do one route and then that's the way it looked i know i, I wish there was a making of for that particular yeah. thing um it was way too fast like i was like what the fuck so it's a <laughs> minute and 30 seconds because yeah. we were down there shooting a a, a commercial oh and, okay and so and uh, you know you go to movies theater in foreign in different countries different places around right. the world all the the there 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 are these minute and a half minute or minute and a half long advertisements ahead of the uh, instead of the instead of trailers for other movies there's it. like the advertising okay and so um uh HSI which is a production company in LA had um had got a contract with uh Hollywood brand cigarettes Oh my God. And there's a reason you're shaking your head that you've never heard of them right. is it was a Brazilian brand um, and only sold like it. it and I, I, I'm just going to trot this out. It's every, you know, statute of limitations yeah. long gone. It's a bad, you know, whatever, but it only sold in certain South American countries and Eastern Europe because of whatever toxic shit got <laughs> it went into these fucking cigarettes that they, whatever special stuff the, they put in the special stuff that, you know, to get you more addicted or to get you, give you a little more buzz, right. um, uh, was something that the FDA was not down with here gotcha. or other countries that yeah, had stricter, yeah. um, rules about that stuff. So, uh, they did th three different commercials. One of them was the iceberg climbing thing in Antarctica. There was another one a friend of mine was on. They were sandboarding down those dunes, those giant ass dunes in Namibia, yeah. and then flying this like single engine acrobatic plane over at the same time, which was pretty, so my friend Andrew and another, um, another guy who pro snowboarders went over there and figured that whole thing out of like, yeah, you use pledge on the bottom of your board and you dull the edges. So you know, like they had a whole thing to make the boards go faster. Um, and then there was another one, which is riding dirt bikes around a, like an open pit mine somewhere. Okay. And with nods and the whole nine, That's it cool. was fucking yeah. wild. Wow. <laughs> um, so I did those three different commercials and, and um, <laughs> so I got on the climbing one. Right. Um, a as, you know, so myself, Mark Wilford, um, there was a couple other people that, uh, a couple, of, one other uh, climber, um, a gal from Yosemite whose name escapes me right now, which is, uh, um, we were the talent, and then a bunch of other hitters from the climbing community, um, Rolo Garibaldi, Kevin Swagger, Bob McDougal, um, who were on the safety crew. Got it. And we went down, and the thing is like, we're going to climb icebergs out of Zodiacs. And I'm like, it sounds like a great idea. This is, and, I was like trying to figure out, okay, I, I know what I'll be wearing. I know that doesn't look at all like scuba diving equipment. <laughs> uh, I know that, uh, my crampons have 12 points each. So that's 24 there plus two from the ice tool, maybe a third ice tool for a spare in case I break a pick. So I've got like, uh, these sharp points and this is a fucking inflatable boat. Yeah. This is like, this makes no fucking like, right. water's, so we water's right. a little cold, had to figure this out. In fact, it's where, where we were, it's, the water temperature itself is below freezing, but the salt content is yeah. so high yeah. that it, it's still liquid. Right. And, um, and it was, I mean, that was one of the more, as far as like fucking a ball or boondoggle trip goes, yeah. it's like, I will never be able to afford going to Antarctica. So I will do a cigarette Fuck commercial yeah. and people Fuck will be yeah. like, you guys are promoting cigarettes. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did, you, <laughs> did you see what yeah, we, we did? <laughs> and then they hired a smoke and this guy, that, so there was a guy that they hired to be the smoker. Yeah. So like. He looked completely out of place. I oh, noticed totally. that. I was like, what the fuck is that guy doing? Why are they smoking at the top of this? It's the first thing. Because it's celebrating, you know, because oh, it's because it's some cool shit. But apparently he's a guy who can make smoking look cool. Like, cause I I'd just be like the cigarette. Right. <laughs> oh, right. Shit. Um, not that bad. Cause I did smoke a little bit in my life, but, um, 
but he, you know, he's a craggy looking, Yeah, yeah. you know, it's like outdoor, you know, they're just like, who's the Marlboro man? Who's not like, who's yeah. that guy? Yeah. yeah. And I can't remember that dude's name, but, um, he was, the, you know, that was his whole job is like, we're going to helicopter you to the top of this fucking iceberg for the smoking moment. You just have to be with us on this fucking, you know, 210 foot boat going from sailing from Ushuaia across the Drake passage to the Antarctic peninsula. Dude. Every just fucking seasick as fuck. Right. Like everybody just horrible. Like. Well, uh, and that, the it, image that I saw, which I thought was so fucking cool was you guys were at the top of whatever it was. Yeah. Right. Iceberg then, in the middle of nowhere that if there's not a helicopter, you're not getting there. You're not getting there. Incredible. Cause it's ocean below you. And it's just such a, it's such a badass image of climbers going up and you're climbing this fucking ice wall out in the middle of nowhere. It's just like so fucking crazy. It was insane. Yes. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> I can't. It's like, and I mean, there is, and there's kind of a shot at the, um, the, the, the tail end of the, the, the thing that's on the, my old website. Right. Um, there is like the, the, the in shot is of this, helicopter like going off and then it just kind of disappears into the sun and it's completely overexposed and it completely just, and, uh, I have had like been dropped off by helicopter in some places before. Right. Like when we did that, the big rescue on top of McKinley, which, um, you know, okay. I know I can get down from here. Right. Like, yeah, you dropped me off on the football field. It's I, like I have 19 out. five or whatever it is. And right. I can maybe it's 19 eight. Um, it's the highest CH 47 landing. I think to this day still where they wow. actually let pe- put people out. Um, and, but I know I can get down from here. Yeah. Like shit goes bad. I mean, I just walked in, you know, I go down the normal route. Yeah. It's right. climbing, whatever, but I can get it down from here. I can get dropped off on an iceberg <laughs> yeah. and the helicopter flies away. Just like this is home. Dude, I hope to come back. <laughs> like, because because that one that um in the for the final smoking moment uh um in in that particular TV thing, I mean that was out in the channel. I mean that thing was a long ways away. I mean far enough away that I I don't think um we ever got a zodiac from the mothership out to that thing. It was all helicopter access. Okay, and the other and some of the more technical pieces that we did were on a big ass iceberg that was in this thing they call the iceberg cemetery. There's a, where the current um, pushes these icebergs into this bay and there's a little water outlet at the end of it. So it's almost like a strainer. Got it. Like in, in a, in yeah, a yeah. river where the water, the current pushes these, these things there. And, the, and I think the, the this place is, um, I think they, they dropped, they had 175 meters of chain on the anchor for the boat and it didn't hit bottom. Holy shit. So it's deep and it's fucking black. black. And that water is black. Black. I mean, you just go, okay, it's below freezing. It's black. This is fucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> like if you go like, and, and the, the whole idea of like, and no one had, um, and Alex Lowe had done, had been on like a sailboat trip or something and climbed an iceberg somewhere. Right. And we got some, you know, some in, input from some scientists is like, you do know that icebergs will spontaneously explode into like millions and millions of little pieces. <laughs> I'm like, no, I didn't. Cool. So I'm going to be hitting it. <laughs> or that one piece will break off yeah. and the whole thing will flip upside down. <laughs> like that's all it takes. It's like, yeah. Cause there's like a, there's an equilibrium, especially oh, if they're Jesus. floating. Um, and they'll, and a lot of times you see these things where there's like a, look, there's an iceberg and it looks like a big arch. Right. Because the water has just been, you know, just the waves have been breaking against it, breaking against it, breaking against it, it forms an arch. And, uh, um, uh, one of those, you know, the directors like we're in the Zodiac out in the, this iceberg cemetery and they're like that arch, man, that's super cool. I want to film you guys, you know, sending your, you know, driving your Zodiac beneath that. And we're like, Anything for a dollar. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I hope we get away with it. But, and we did see when I mean, we came across one of those blown up icebergs, like, cause right. when they, when they blow up and they become, you know, chunks that are, you know, they're small. Right. And, and then it'll just be like an oil slick in the middle of the Lemaire channel or someplace like that, where like current kind of assembles all of those 
different chunks into this thing. And they're like, okay, here lies iceberg. Right. Um, and then we did watch one from distance, you know, big ice cliff kind of calve off the side and the whole thing just like, boom. And so Mark Wilford and I were looking at that and we're like, what the fuck do we do <laughs> if that, ha- okay, if it explodes, we're dead. If it flips, we're dead. Right. The only thing where we might end up in the water where we're still alive is if one of us, like if we fall. Right. And then you're in the water uh, with, you know, we're still lo- using leashes on our ice tools. <laughs> right. We're still got, you know, a rope tied right. to a guy who's belaying us supposedly. All that shit has to get cut away. Yeah. Um, somehow we had a PFD, like a little golf ball outside of my jacket, but they didn't want like life preservers yeah. in- right. invisible in 28 yeah. degree water. Yeah. Good luck. In 28 degree water. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like how long? Good gonna, fucking luck. I mean, but we had a really, I mean, the, the safety team was, those guys, you know, they're legit. A lot of like McDougal and Kevin Swigert, they're like serious whitewater kayakers. They've been in the water a lot. Um, and, you know, those guys had dry suits on and it was, you know, somebody, one of us goes in their job, you know, even if, you know, I had some stuff on underneath, it's just like, man, pull the fucking golf ball, get the knife out. Don't stab the PFD accidentally, <laughs> try and cut the ice tools off, try and cut the rope off and then dog paddle for the last 45 seconds of your life, I guess. <laughs> I, don't know, like, I don't know. Try not to pass um, out while they recover you. But this one day, like the, the first day we actually got on iceberg climbing, there was, um, uh, and I think Wilford was leading and he gets out of the boat. We figured out this way where you like, you know, guy stand, we made these wooden platforms and I got you like use the little motor and like pin the nose of the Zodiac in that platform. Right against the iceberg and the waters, you know, the, the, the Zodiac is moving, um, at a, at a different rate than the iceberg is. Right. Right. So, you, so it's kind of going up. And so we had this idea where you'd like the, it, it, the, the platform would rise, you'd sink one ice tool without a leash on it, leave it there, ride the, 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 the platform back down, come back up, grab that one that was in the place, pull onto the iceberg with your feet, swing the next one in. And then the guy had reversed the boat away while feeding out slack with the, uh, in, in the rope. So he didn't pull you off. What the fuck? So, <laughs> if, what so, fuck? so if you fall off at that point, you don't fucking puncture the Zodiac. And then everybody, then everybody dies yeah. and everybody dies. Oh, this is great. Like, oh, <laughs> look, wow. only would a non FDA approved cigarette company oh, from South man. America ever Approve this. Oh, no shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go for it. Oh, and how many waivers have you signed? I don't know, like 30 pages of every day I have to sign a new waiver <laughs> you know, or something. Um, and then climb up, put a nice screw in, something where the, like, the guy could belay normally and then get the Zodiac in and maybe a little bit off to the side. Oh, like where he could pull and, in slack because now you have a little bit of pro. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. And um, and then on, on the really big... But that that first day, there was one point where the fucking ice tool hit the thing, and there's just like like this crack sounds, um, and and it like resonates, and you can hear it kind of deep, deep, Dude, deep in the iceberg. Ice makes a and, weird fucking sound when it does that. And and the oh. thing is, there's like in the in the in most sort of glacial situations, you've got like all this ice moving. <laughs> in between these rock walls where it's like, it's supported. Yeah. Like in between the glaciers get down, there's, there's supported from underneath and supported from the sides. Generally, once they break off the shelf and they're in the ocean, there's nothing holding them together. So they're right. trying to fall apart. Like there's right. no gravity. There's no nothing. And you hear the, I heard, heard this crack and I was just like, <laughs> fucking new underwear, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just Like there's, uh, it it was utterly fucking terrifying because it, then the whole thing of them breaking into pieces or yeah. cracking off and flipping over um, became really legit. And so we thought, we realized like, okay, we need to film some of this stuff where we can swing, where we can climb without having to hit. Got it. And so climbed up an easier side of the big face that we, we did and then um, Rolo went, you know, we lowered him over the side with a with a, 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 a hilti drill with a big old bit on it. Right. And so all of the ice tool placements were drilled into the ice so he could just like oh, just okay. hook gotcha. these holes right. instead of like 
Okay. Because yeah. like you're there, you're just like, this is the stupidest right. thing. This is the stupidest thing. This is why am I doing this? Yeah. Like, this is how I die. Which yeah. one of these is going to be the last one? Yeah. 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 So that we did you know, creatively solve some stuff. It was still really, really fucking terrifying. And, and, and a couple of, one of the pictures that's on the, on the website is of this, this uh, little lagoon yeah. in, in an iceberg yeah. where the, and the it's boats, got, you put the boats in there, put the right? Zodiacs yeah. in there. And it's like aqua, I mean, it's just yeah. beautiful blue water. It looks like a, like a white sand beach in the Bahamas. Yeah. And, you know, and the safety diver was like, somebody dropped a radio battery right. in that little thing. And um, you can't leave them in the water. You know, right. you're below a certain parallel. There's like very strict rules about littering and what can, Got it. you know, go in the, you know, like if you, there's trash and you can recover it, you have to, or the fine is enormous. Got it. And so we had to send him down. I'm sure he was to, super stuck. Super, oh, like, super who the pumped. fuck <laughs> dropped super a battery <laughs> in, in all the places? Like not, not oh the 600 foot God. deep, you know, spot out here. We're going to drop it here. We're going to oh drop it here God. where it's like 40 feet deep Thanks, dog. only. Thanks. And just like, oh man, that's an ice cream headache yeah, for I don't know a week or something. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, that guy. That guy was uh, he was a fucking stud too. That shit. That shit sucks. Water that cold, diving in that stuff. How? Yeah. That's miserable. I like, but it's a thing, right? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I've done like ten hour dives in the winter Jeez. in the uh, in the Sound outside right. of Seattle. Super and like warm. you get out of there and like it took it takes like 45 minutes to get feeling in your feet in a hot yeah. tub like so you feel that, like your bones are cold right like oh, sure so the sound in the, is that like more than 40 but less than 50 degrees maybe yeah, yeah maybe it's yeah. like it's like 50s okay I used to dive up there it's pretty uh, cold yeah it's super cold like i would drink a gallon of water it's uncomfortable get in a seven mil wetsuit okay and piss yeah. my and then yeah. try to piss the entire time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah that's about right. Yeah. I, I'd literally be driving out there, like chugging a gallon of water before I got in the water, <laughs> yeah. just like trying to get in there and yeah, stay a little so. bit warm. It's, but it's special. It's special. Yeah. yeah. Your face is like, you can't like talk can't properly. No. No. So hand signals. Your decision making is fantastic. Sure. But that, that, those, that piece, that, that, that piece of imagery with the, that video, I was like, what in the fuck were you guys doing? Which I'm so glad you explained that because I'm like, why is this only a minute, a minute and a half? How is this not a half How an is hour? This not a fucking documentary on what what you guys did because I'm like, why did you guys? It looks like because not putting it into context, right? It looks yeah. like you guys are like, fuck it, let's go to Antarctica, and then you climb this big. <laughs> Massive wall, so go through this we, and then huge we, logistics fucking nightmare to get down half, there. Yeah, spent <laughs> a spare hundred thousand yeah. dollars, well, climbed in, seventy-five yeah. feet iceberg, and went home. It was awesome. Home. It was like <laughs> we smoked some cigarettes and fucking rolled out. I'm like in today's day and age, what is that? There would be somebody there filming a documentary. Yeah, it would be like you know some idiot would do it for Instagram now yeah. or something. You know, right? there are like stories or yeah. something. Hey, here I am atop the iceberg, <laughs> my cigarette. Yeah. But there may be a making of that HSI had that went away. Um, Paul Giroux was the director um, uh, and, and, the, and the main operator, uh, camera operator on that job. Um, Mikhail Gladys was this, uh, this guy who was a, uh, the other operator. And they worked together all the time. Oh. And um, it was uh, so two years later, they were doing a, uh, uh, another TV commercial type thing, or I think it was a commercial. And they were up in the Yukon. And uh, rotor and the helicopter they were in clipped the sidewall of this glacier. Helicopter went sideways into a crevasse, and everybody got killed. Wow! And um, and Whoa. so happily, you know, happily that little cut. Um, the the one that's on the website is the director's cut. I don't think I ever right. got a final cinema version with the logoing, you know, the logoing at each right. end. But um, uh, uh, Paul was a super cool dude, and um. I mean, he, he pushed talent really hard to do shit that he thought would look better than. Oh no way! <laughs> I know. Weird, huh? You don't Weird. Say. <laughs> no, I mean, no, just like jump off the zodiac onto the iceberg. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, it looked great. Um, here, to get, to guess what? We'll hold. The, we'll put the camera in the water, and you jump over it, land on the iceberg, and um, <laughs> that shot is in actually the thing. But Rollo told me about a, a job they did in the desert at some point where 
he he got pushed really hard to do shit that he didn't think was safe. Um, and you just have to, you know, in that position as a climber, you just got to say, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I'm all good. Well, um, but once, so he sent me his director's cut and with that music, and I think it's the opening music is from this, uh, it's a Daniel Lenoir piece from the Sling Blade soundtrack. Really? And then the, and then the, uh, the, the, once the ice climbing starts, it's a pirated prodigy song. Right. Um, which I thought was pretty cool, but he sent me that and I was hoping to be able to get another job with him at some point. Cause I was, that, that was a well-paid gig. Yeah. I mean, bought my first Leica with, you know, money from that job. How long, how long were you, how long was that entire evolution? It was like, um, I, I two and a half weeks on away from Ushuaia on the boat. Right. Whoa. Yeah, that's a lot of time. So it, it was yeah. a, it was a long time, and yeah. we were and we were only ever on actual solid land for a you know in on the Antarctic Peninsula for about three hours one day. The rest of it was either in the boat, in the Zodiac, or on a on a or in a helicopter or on an iceberg. So everything was like there was a lot of drinking, <laughs> <laughs> and it was a Russian research boat, um, the Professor Kromov, and um, with a you know. Full Russian, like a crew, yeah, and a, uh, and to include the cook, right? Yeah. Vodka, plenty. So, yep. Vodka yeah, and, and cigarettes. And the Argentine sure. Kilmes, you know, Kilmes beer, <laughs> which was kind of my favorite. It was like it's Q I L M E S or something, I think. But, um, yeah, we we before getting on the boat, Wilford and I went to the liquor store. We're just like, this, this feels like I went on, when I got on the boat, saw the accommodations. I was like, this looks like a hard drinking job. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, yeah. So I, I, I kind of went through a few things here okay. and so you talked, I was, I was watching an interview with you earlier and you're talking about kind of feeding the beast in a sense of, and I, I didn't quite get the first snippet of it and it sounded as if you're talking about, was it social media what you're referencing in that, in that context? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, um, early on, I mean, especially with Jim, with the Jim Jones and, and yeah. early on it was, you know, there was no Twitter page. There was yeah. no, any of that stuff because I realized watching some friends do it, who wanted to participate in that social media space is like once you open that beast's mouth. Right. It is never not hungry. Mm. Like you better have banked content, you know, long in advance for the time when you, you know, for those days that you're tired or nothing right. happens or whatever, because once it's a weird thing, it gets uh, used to, uh, you know, accustomed to eating, you know, on a certain day or whatever. Like yeah. I need to put up episode 128 right. of our, you know, the nonprofit podcast yesterday. But it might not happen, you know. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, it certainly didn't. Obviously, didn't happen yesterday. Uh, I might edit it tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and and put it up. But there's like, it, it, oh, but you guys always post on Monday. I'm like, yeah. Haven't you seen the sign in our podcast studio? It says, you know, home of the nonprofit podcast, recorded weekly, usually. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, and 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 I don't honestly think now after enough. Um, time in relationship to that beast uh that i think the expectation of the beast being hungry is my expectation of its expectation like i created that in my head sure. yeah in, okay. in a way like you right. don't have to play that game you know right. it depends and if people are are you know are con expected to be consistent well, fuck them what is right you know well and why you, you, you thought your your you know your essential job was <laughs> consistent right. also and um but it, so in the beginning we didn't have a twitter page or whatever and and i uh um and i started doing that but i was i would i would bank shit you know because right. you could uh using the i was using a different client not twitter itself and i'm i think it was called hootsuite oh yeah um at the time yeah. and i could program shit and i just right. like I'd, I'd program especially um when i was doing my personal page and i'd do a music video every once a week or whatever it right. was, I'd fucking program those things months in advance. Right. Like I'd sit up one night, you know, just plug just them all in, plug them all in. And, and so with the gym, it was kind of the same thing. I'd, I'd 
plug in and if we had additional stuff that was right. current then do it then but um uh uh I, then there was a, ultimately a facebook page for the gym and i was yeah. just like no that you can, no you just post it at the one then it goes to the others and i'm like well they're facebook twitter and instagram are, are different things you right. know that right like you couldn't you don't just put them all there this one's good for this and this one's better for this and yeah. Well, the, my question to this is like, <clears throat> I've seen your, your, a lot of your work, you know, your, your books and your photographs and, you know, when you classify yourself as a climber, but really when, when I look at what you're doing, like you're, 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 you seem like a artist, uh, very much of an artist, but you're, putting these pieces of content together, whether it's through the form of, you know, the gym or whether it's through climbing, it seems like, but you have a, you have a fucking, a crazy person's eye when it comes to detail. Like I would, I, I don't know how to I, if describe I'm that. I, I don't know how to describe what you do other than you'd have to go and go to your pages and look and, you know, get one of your books if you if you can actually get them i mean because i <laughs> most of the time like sometimes i think it's hard to get the times too but yeah like what you do is uh i don't know it, it just strikes me as a person that i i don't know it's it's a sociopathic commitment to perfection in a way that you don't see that very often in in any photograph or design or it it but it it kind of encompasses i think a lot of what you what you do even when you write you're you're fairly intense in a lot of the writing and your essays and then you, the photographs that you're putting out your content the things that you're you know the routes that you've put up like what is that? I, I think what, I, what's going on there, and I, think, I don't know if you you don't you don't you probably might I, not even have an I, even a way to answer it, but. I don't, I'd like to hear Trevor trying to answer <laughs> no, no. the first. Or, or what Please. I, I have a situation that involved just the two of us that can at least sort of describe how focused that energy can be. So let's see. This was like two symposiums ago, maybe. And I knew that you were getting like a little fatigued with humans. But you also had a podcast to edit. And we had, Aaron and I had been cooking all day and I knew that you wanted to have some of that food. So I made a plate and, um, or we made a plate, like, oh, let's set some aside for Mark. He's, he's down there editing, like, cause you know, it has to get done, period. Right. It has yeah. to get done now. Like it doesn't right. matter if there's 20 people upstairs. This fucking has to happen right now. Right. Um, and so we're like, oh, we'll set the side. And I, I think everybody else breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief when I'm like, I'll take it downstairs. Like, don't fucking worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think I saw Aaron like visibly like, oh, okay, good. I'm not doing it. Yeah, don't go. <laughs> don't, there's a hungry beast. Don't go poke don't, the bear. Yeah. <laughs> so I walked downstairs and opened the door and no words were spoken. I held up the plate of food and you looked at me and you just did this. And I was like, and you're like, yeah, and I just put it down and just sort of backed out of that room and closed the door. And I don't think I saw you for like two days later and you were like, hey, no, that wasn't about you. Like, it was this and this and this and I got it. But I think that kind of describes like that level of intensity is that had to happen and that meant no people interrupting him, no food, nothing, period. Right. Like, no, I can't even pull a word out of my mouth to direct it at you because that the energy is going here. Into this thing, and if I, it has to get done right. And if I take a break, it's not going to get done the way it needs to get done because there's a train of thought that's going on. And I mean, and you understand this, I think, and Michael understands very well. Also, is like you could come in in that time, see what the problem is, figure out a solution, come back, but without asking for an entry point for conversation. Right. Like, okay, I, I can help this process that's happening right now by doing X and then going away, going away or right. whatever. And that, I mean, that kind of describes yeah. life a little bit right now, but, um,
I let, I overthink mm. and maybe over concentrate. Like it, I, okay. The joking response to that is, mm. I don't have three ex wives for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which is yeah, but you know, a lot of people got have been sacrificed to my to the pursuit condition. If I would, I mean, I, I can't. I'm not going to blame it because I take responsibility. I mean, a lot of, and, and often it's voluntary. It's like, look, right. I, I I am doing this. This is the most important thing. No one can not take that personally. Mm-hmm. Unless it's someone who's a right. you know a peer, a, a, a friend who has been around and seen it, and, and, and or maybe is obsessive in their own right, yeah. And I way. think that's you no, know, like, or I could let's say obsessive yeah. in their own way and look at directly at you, Logan. I don't know, but I'm guessing if you're in here, also you have a bit of that. Um, and and, and those and those are people who can understand it and yeah. not be have a negative you know affected or you know. But if somebody walks in and they're like. Hey, I'm here to help. Like, thank you for not helping. Mm-hmm. Is like a please leave. Uh, uh, oh. And and I, I'm not. Um, I, I like. Man, I, there was an Andrew Eldritch quote, something like, "If I do it myself." then I can't blame anybody mm. when it's done wrong. Right, right. Except myself. And, uh, you know, I like things done a certain way and, or, you know, and I'm, I, I've been trying to, you know, delegate. And actually we have a really, with the business now, it's, uh, I think that the, the, everybody recognizes we're, mm. we're old dudes now, <laughs> like, right. or I am anyway. Like everybody recognizes what, someone's attributes are and like, right. Oh, you can do this better mm. or I can do this. Oh, give it to him. He'll stay up all night. Right. Until it's done, you know? Um, and, and I don't know the, if, if talking about, you know, photographs or a, an, an artistic, I don't know where that came from, mm. but it, but it did, but it's there. It did. And I can, and, um, and I, and I practice. Right. <laughs> I practice because um i mean i don't need any practice being an asshole right but well i mean I'm not I, but i practice right. I'm you know the technical bits you know like the, the because it's it, it it's um i will get get home from somewhere and you know uh friend said it recently re- recently got got back from a long trip and you know first things first man i go it's you know just been out all day, driven four hours to get back or whatever. We get home. I go turn the computer, you know, A, I start charging camera batteries that got spent. B, I go to, you know, the computer, turn it on. doesn't matter. It's midnight. It's one o'clock in the morning. Don't give a fuck. This stuff has to get moved off of this card onto another drive. You know, I'll leave right. the backup on the, or leave it on the card, but it's got to go onto another drive right now mm. because I've, I've done like, all of these safeguards need to be done. It's just, you know, in the mountains, like, right. okay, we're going to stop here, brew up for a while, whatever. Everything is clipped in because if it gets dropped, it's fucking gone forever. Right. So all of the, that, that attention to detail is, you know, born of necessity mm. and then still a little bit of a weird, I mean, obsessive habit where, yeah, I, I can get away with it. You know, SD right. cards, man, they don't, they're, they're not as, you know, they don't blow up like they used to right. or with the frequency that they used to or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, but, but old habits, I guess, mm-hmm. in a way. <laughs> well, it sounds and, like, or I have to imagine at least part of that is because, uh, you know, you've lived a lot of life and you've seen some people make some pretty huge sacrifices maybe because they haven't been that way. And that's just become so ingrained in you. And like, same thing with, Combat, like you I was see just going to say, you come back mistakes, right? from doing something, you change out the battery. You don't charge the yeah. batteries; you just get new ones, probably depending on the you know yeah. level you're. So you change out the batteries. You even if the weapon yeah. wasn't fired, it mm-hmm. gets a, it gets you know it's a gets a seeing to horse gun cowboy. Mm-hmm. Take care of yourself last. You know? Yeah, you yeah. take care of the things that are going to keep you alive first. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and and um and then expect others to do the same. Right. And then 
get really fucking bummed out and disappointed and angry and with them when they don't. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Super helpful for personal relationships. That's yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> it works, that, works that, out fantastic. That's, that's kind of Every what time. I was getting it's, at. It's, it's really good. It works out great. It's really kind of what, I'm, what I was getting at was like, you know, just personally when I look at things and then, you know, dealing with individual relationships and my wife or whomever it is, you know, I've had to really kind of sacrifice when I say that, like I've had to just take a bat to that feeling and, and just beat the living fucking dog shit out of it on a regular basis. Cause it's so painful in the context of, Oh, I need to get this done. I have a level of commitment here and it's been very difficult to balance and specifically with my own personality. And I've had to really explore what the fuck is going on and not by any stretch of the imagination. Am I comparing myself to you? I'm just saying like, there's something there, right? Where your pursuit of perfection and your ability to, to push past your physical and psychological thresholds to meet an expectation that's ultimately internally driven that has to, does it, do you understand that? Do you feel it? Does it, is it like something that you're, I mean, it is, I, 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 I do recognize that it is internally driven. Like I set up the, you know, success slash failure condition, like, and right. the expectations of myself in my own head. And it's like, um, especially now, like the situation Trevor's describing with that podcast, it's like, it didn't need to get out that night, mm. you know, or whatever, ideally, because the world's not going to, it's not like the fireworks factory is going to blow up if I don't get this <laughs> podcast out, you know, or some, right, right. you know, ridiculous thing, but it just, um, but I said, uh, I wish I had been able to take a bat to that, mm. um, because it's, uh, it's, you know, cost some things that, um, were ultimately worth more probably, you know, that, right. that, um, and then I go, uh, leopard spots. <laughs> yeah. Shit. I mean, and that could just be right. a cop out excuse, yeah. um, to keep doing what I do. But if it, but if the net result of that is that, um, uh, certain people, who don't deserve to get sacrificed yeah. do or are, or, um, you know, my happiness outside of task accomplishment right. is compromised or is the opposite of happiness. Then maybe I would be better off with, you know, taking a bat to my own. Well, because it's <laughs> interesting. Cause as you're talking, I actually wrote these things down where it, what sacrifices have you made in the pursuit of, uh, your, your commitment to quality or your commitment to the mission? Uh, personal relationships, strong yeah. one for sure. Um, but then it's also, uh, the chassis. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. R I, I I call it a permanently broken left angle, but it's not really broken. It's just that there was no ATFL for a long time, and now the arthritis is so bad, um, and the and and the, the looseness that you know I wear normally wear. I didn't knew I was not going to be doing a, on my feet all day today, so I can wear Birkenstocks. Right. But normally it's a you know I, there's a brace on that thing all the time. Three knee surgeries on my left knee, two shoulder rebuilds, hip replacement, right? Um, that stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, the mental stuff that I just, by way of fulfilling or responding to those obsessions, reinforces a particular psychological condition mm -hmm. that gives other people the Heisman right. as a way of life. Yeah. You know, like, don't get, you know, you can't get close. <clears throat> and I'm definitely going to stiff arm and run away or, we'll, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the, or you might get sacrificed to my, like I, these things are important to me. This isn't, as, this isn't important enough. Tick tock. I'd, I'd rather had this discussion recently. I, I, I think, um, 
been, you know, being happy hasn't been a, an objective ever. Right. Like getting shit done has been an objective, like accomplishing things, figuring out stuff to do that will make, and maybe that's ego. You know, maybe it makes me a better person. Maybe I do that. Maybe I think I need to be better vis-a-vis an audience or comparative mm-hmm. with others. Um, I'd love to think it was purely internal, but I know that's not true. And um, and now, like the whole TikTok thing, I want to, you know, it's even more apparent mm-hmm. um, at a certain wanna, age. That you want to put happiness a little bit more on the higher on the priority list? Apparently not. <laughs> 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 well, I guess I, I guess I mean, that's my my question is is you have you have seen and done things like experiences that that people such as myself, you know, we I mean, I'm envious of of a lot of the things that you've done in the, in the context of like, fuck, dude, what what has gone through those eyes and into that brain? is something that cannot be replicated, right? You can't replicate. Obviously, that's the true with anybody's I think experience, it's true but with it's anybody, fucking yeah. insane what has happened as far as like even putting into context of of the ice climbing or Antarctica or any of these other things. You're like, fuck, dude, the guy has seen and done some things. But giving amazing things. <laughs> no, it's like a truly amazing Wait, then things. you did what? <laughs> and then you did what? The fuck? And then you did what? Yeah. yeah. But given your yeah. yourself like in this in the context of, you know, guys that are are like you, like what what type of what type of advice <laughs> would you have for them other than um I I don't know. Yeah. You know, like, like I would love to <sighs> It's in my ebook, man. You just get a buy. What's the ebook? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Send it over, yeah, man. It's, we'll post um, the link. It, 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 I, uh, I mean, the reintegration thing um, is, you know, especially like if you spent any amount of time in the military context mm. or whatever, and then, and then you you are coming back from experiences that you know, into a world made of people who cannot understand those experiences. Right. And at some point you'll get, you know, you just get tired of trying to explain yourself. Um, and, and then you end up, you know, end up associating only with your echo chamber. Right. In, in a way. And I think it's, was really important for me to, once I quit climbing, you know, and I tried to, uh, I mean, I, tried a number of different different things one of the reasons that i went way down the competitive shooting road i mean for for me anyway was to you know because of the the focus it required Mm -hmm. like i could completely zone out and meditate while while reloading right because i mean i'd just be down in my little basement for you know four hours at a time i'd just put some you know hemi sync or some kind of binaural beats type music on my headphones and just like You know, it, so there was that disassociative aspect of right. it. Um, but then in the moment when, you know, like, okay, you're in the hole, you're on deck, you're up, man, just the narrowing of fork it, focus and the, and the increasing heart rate and stuff um, was something that, that, that I, I think, you know, I mean, if concentration is, a, is exclusion by, by, by definition. <coughs> and uh, so that was all, so that, that laser focus you know, for however long, a 15 second, 30 second stage, something like that. Um, and every and, and all of, you know, getting up into it, um, it's also a disassociation in a, in a way, but it's also didn't, at that point, I was looking for something to fill the void and not, didn't, you know, t- it wasn't, it was probably 15 years later when I realized that, okay, the void is necessary because I right. used to do a thing that created my identity. I no longer do the thing. And now I have to find my way. And so that void can't be filled and we can, you know, try all different shit, but, you know, um, the guys I was, you know, one of the guys that I was with this weekend, um, who, you know, is Marine Corps, then Air Force, and then contracting for a bit, you know, a lot of times I think the contracting gig, it's not only, I mean, a certain era, it was a way to, you know, be paid for all the hours that you worked right. in the military, but didn't get paid for. Um, yeah. it, it seemed like right. there was a, 
there was a, a period there. Um, but then when the money, you know, part of that kind of declined and dudes were happy to go to work for $200 a day, yeah. um, or whatever, uh, um, then the reason to go back to it was like, because of the fellowship, the camaraderie, right. the stress, the, 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 that, that piece. And, and, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who's, who go climbing and I, and I look at it and I, I don't. I don't look at it and go, man, you're just repeating yourself. And that's silly. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like I, it, it's just my way. I didn't, you know, I couldn't take that next step. And so I stopped and moved on. And then when I got out of the training business and, you know, or certainly in, in the Hollywood context it was like, look, I've learned everything I can from this. Right. And if I go back I mean, the last job I did, I realized like I'm oh, only here for the paycheck. Right. And I don't want to be, I don't want to live like that. Mm. <laughs> and because it's not worth it. Like I can go be broke and learning, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> you know, or this, or, or working on something that will eventually provide enough of a living that I'll get back all of the, you know, investment. Um, I mean, I'll knock on wood for that one, right. but, um, uh, I, I, um, I, I don't know for me, like the sense, like I want to keep learning. I want to keep making things and keep accomplishing. And there's a, there, there is a, a, a you know, I think satisfaction can masquerade pretty well as happiness sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. And, uh, And I, th yeah, but the pursuit of the actual in state of like, I just want to go like lay on the, you know, I don't know right. what would, what's a happy, a thing that makes people happy. You know, I, 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 I mean, I, I drove, you know, 12 hours to go to do two day shooting course and right. hang out with some cool guys. And then another 13 hours or whatever on the way back yesterday. Yeah. Um, it, and like, was I, ha and I was, was I happy up there? Yeah. There was a couple of times when everything came together on a stage or, you know, course of fire or whatever. And I actually solved the problem appropriately or something where I was, is that happiness or is that satisfaction? Shit. I don't know. Right. You know, or staying up late, drinking beer with like, you know, and having a conversation with some guy that, you know, with whom there's overlap and we have ideas about art and action and the, and the philosophy of both. Um, is that, is that learning or is that happiness? Right. Or is it both? And, um, and that's, uh, yeah, I want to get better with this. I want to get better. I, I want to improve at certain things. And if other things go away because of that for a little bit, I mean, I was joking recently, a couple of months ago, when he's asking me, Hey, you've been shooting any pictures? And then I'm like, I said, no, I've been shooting guns, man. <laughs> and, and, but the if obsessive part of me wanting to do it as well as I can is that I can't do both. Well, I think to the, to the, at the level I want. Well, I think that was kind of where I, I wanted to head was, you know, this, to be good at, at anything, you have to be obsessive, right? And there are sacrifices that have to be made. I think yep. you, you are, whether you, you have no idea, right, whether you know this or not, but you had such a profound impact on my adult life. You, you don't know it, but you did because here's these, you know, this, this guy out there, Mark Twight that was writing and, and writing books and doing this thing. And, and you were from the outside, it was like, here's this guy that's living way outside the, the template for American happiness. And I'm not going to buy into that narrative. I don't have to buy into this narrative, yeah. right? I don't have to buy into, okay, I'm going to go to high school. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go work for a bank. I'm going to buy a Toyota Corolla. I'm going to get fleet, pleated front dockers. I'm going to backslap my <laughs> fucking fraternity brothers on the weekends. And that sounds so fucking stupid and bullshit to me <laughs> that I can't buy into it, man. Like yeah. there's no way I can do that. It, it's just so painful. And it's I fucking, don't want that Cheetos. Life. I don't want it, man. Like, yeah. but 
here's you, right? And you're out there and you're posting these fucking gnarly epic adventures that are just like, fuck it, let's send it, man, in a way that's this well, let's template, try it. right? And that to me is like guys like me, at least, you know, back in the day, I was looking at that going, fuck yeah. There's somebody out there. That's- fucking rad there's <laughs> there's somebody out there there's, there's a lot of guys because like, there's fuck like, yeah there's so many people that just go step by step by step well and, and i'm like but with and i think with un, and unconsciously right, right and just yeah. like the expectations get put on people early and to to the to the to the degree that they don't even recognize that it happened like yeah hey you got socially engineered to be that bank teller yeah. right yeah. I mean, and a pair of pleated dockers in the right situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, or, or you know, you get... <laughs> Not you, bad, you know? like <laughs> You get bought into a subculture of people, a tribe, for instance, and yeah. then the yeah. tribe says, well, and you you know it as well as, as well as I do, we know those people out there that are like climbers, right? Because they've got the right stickers on the right car and the right... They're wearing, you know, prana and fucking... They got to... They, they they look really good. They have all the goodies. But they haven't put their hand on a piece of rock other than, you know, the 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 Heideke rock in front of their fucking door in two years. But they look the part, right? Yeah. They they're trying to fall into that tribe. Or or they were in that tribe. Right. Got a you know, decided that the work thing was more, you know, whatever yeah. certain life circumstances took them away from mm-hmm. it. But because it was their identity, they try to preserve that and they realize like, oh, there's a difference. Now I'm bank guy. Right. I'm Docker's guy. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm family and da, da, Toyota Corolla, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm that guy, but, but I, I, I would still like to see myself as this other guy so that I can deal with who I who have, I, to, I have yeah. to look, who, who I've chose to be. Yeah. Right. Or maybe it's not even a choice who I, who, um, I mean, I guess it's all a choice. Yeah. yeah. At some point, but I think a lot of times the, you know, if if you were a climber guy, let's say yeah. before, you know, casually, you know, in in what sense it's like, it's not. I didn't make a positive, an affirmative choice to become bank guy. Mm-hmm. I think I made a, a, a like like multiple lateral steps that got you to this other road. Or it was I need to this you know climber guy has no income. Yeah. Right. I yeah. made an affirmative choice to become income, you know, to be income guy. Right. In order to support this other, these other, you know, fulfill other expectations or things. You know, I was hearing somebody this weekend talking and he's just like, yeah, I can't, can't do, you know, I had to, uh, had to start doing this job because, uh, I, my girlfriend and I, we made a baby. Yeah. You know, and it was, a, it was an accidental thing. He had seen right. his life going in a different direction and was like, well, this is what I'm committed to now. And so I think sometimes stuff happens to us mm-hmm. that uh, um, that causes those decisions to be made. Uh, but but still, I, it, yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 it's easy to look at you know the 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 climber as larper kind, you know that that they're the larper whatever. climbers. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's a fucking great. Yeah, because they're they're yeah. in the they're in the whole you there's, know. There's a lot of larpers in a lot of communities. In a lot of communities, yeah. yeah. But it's easy to look at them and denigrate them. But I'm just like, dude, if that's what you need to do to keep, be able to keep doing this, sure, to provide for the wife and children mm-hmm. to whom you made a commitment, right? I mean, like, I, I'm I'm old enough now that I can, like, six days out of seven, I'm not going to mock you or. You know, yeah. say, but say seventh stupid. day, he yeah. shall mock. Seventh day, I, I shall mock, exactly. <laughs> you know, but I, I think for me, I think for people, and they need to hear it in the context of it's, you know, you do have to be committed to something outside in a way that when I say that, it's, it's to have a maniacal focus over whether it's like, hey, man, maybe, maybe you want to be a banker. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Fucking rad. Go for it. It's when people decide, and I saw it in my previous profession all the time. I used to have this joke about guys that joined the CIA because there's like segments of it where it's like, man, you you got pushed down too much when you were a fucking kid or something, oh, yeah. right? Because the acronym and the image means way more to you than actually the mission. Like, so whether you're committed to actually want to do this, it's like I didn't, I didn't 
become a green beret for the headgear. I came green beret so I could like train indige and live in the fucking middle of wherever and try to go, you know, fuck people up. Like that's what I wanted to do. Over, yeah. You know, and you wanted to do it I, rather than a lot of people, I think when they get, they, they want to have done it. Correct. And they want to say like, they do it. it or, right. you know, so, Whether yeah. or not they're doing the task. They, they want to be able to, be able to put tell a person on the back of their yeah. car. Right. Or yeah. to when somebody asks, you know, what do you do? And they're like, oh, I work for the CIA. Yeah. And as you pointed out, there's a lot of jobs there. You know, I might be a janitor in that building, yeah. but I still work for the CIA. And so you leave it hanging. And it's like you'd, I'd see it in the climbing community, especially with what I would consider the tourist climbers who, you know, would, uh, let's just, we'll just use the big E as, you know, like right. the guys who climbed Everest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, Tell somebody by oh, they, they they omit the fact that they were on a guided trip, right? Where you know the camps were put in place for them, the fixed ropes were put in place for them, their extra oxygen bottles were carried for them, right? Um, and and you know nobody ever says, you know, it freely admits without being point blank questioned, did you use oxygen? Right. No one who did ever says never admits to it because they all fucking know it's cheating, right? So. Like, it's like, yeah, I climbed Everest and then leave it hanging, like the circumstances of that ascent yeah. hanging and allow the the listener to put two and two or two and 12 right. together, you know, whatever it is you're trying to get them to think. Um, and I would imagine it's the same, you know, it's similar in other communities and, and not that, you know, okay, that in fact, there was a guide and the ropes and the camps and the this and the that, you know, it was all in place. You still had to put one foot in front of the other, but it's... But passing it off, trying attempting to pass it off as the same thing as, mm. you know, what uh, my two friends Esteban and Corey tried to do last year was climb a new route on the north side of Everest, you know, no oxygen, trying to do what Barry and I had, had tried to do, you know, a bunch, bunch of years ago there, just two dudes on this unknown terrain and no support and like, go, you know, that's a different thing than what was, yeah. what's going on you know, not far away. Right. You might even be sharing the same base camp or same advanced, same advanced base camp where like, you know, the doctor who has climbed Mount Rainier and Mount McKinley turns up, you know, on the guided trip where, you know, you've been done the whole, you know, apprentice journeyman, maybe approaching mastery kind of thing to get to the same spot. Right. And have the same theater in terms of like where this is all going to play out but in completely different ways and they're, and they're super different. And, but it's also really hard to get somebody like Corey to say how rad what those right. guys tried to do was because guys who are legit don't, yeah, don't have to say it. That's <laughs> so interesting, man. Like, because it's, you see this in different people that in in all walks of life in all of these different subcultures and different skills and sports right so you see it across the board for instance you know we talk about it a lot where you know a guided hunt for instance or a trophy hunt right it's much different if you're trying to go out and hunt on your own and it's not on a you know high fence ranch and you don't have a rifle and you're taking away all your tools and you're actually learning how to hunt versus uh, you know, just going out and fucking shooting something from a mile away that's like chained to a fence. Yeah, that what where Wait, and what, I guess that's a thing. Well, no, it's I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm elaborate. <laughs> I'm, I'm like just exaggerating. Like minor wow, dramatization. You know what I mean in the yeah. sense of like, man. It, <clears throat> yeah. I tr- in that sense, the pursuit of the skill, right? Having the experience and the pursuit of the skill, those things are always way more for me, they're, they're way more interesting, right? It's like what I can really do this. I can do this shit. Like having that versus being able to say, well, well, I ran this river or I fucking posted this route or whatever. It's like, well, but you didn't tell me that the guy put you on his back and carried you up the fucking thing. You know, that's great that you killed a mountain goat in the middle of wherever. And it cost you $250,000. You walked off your helicopter 75 yards away and shot it and fucking got back on. Like, that's that's cool, I guess. Like, yeah, you, you know, I'm so. trying. If you say so, I'm trying. You yeah. know, so that's the conversation where you know the sacrifices that have to be made in order to be good or have this structured discipline and commitment to really the the self, right? So, what is yeah. your perceived 
line or expectation. And I think this is so, so interesting because you're that example for so many guys that are like, Mark Twight puts the line. He he posts the the line for perfection. That's where he's posting Ooh. that shit. So it's like, oh shit. Okay, don't, well there's a guy out there. Now. <laughs> there's a guy out there doing it. Again, I think that that's uh well one it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating to me, but it's like for people out there they they have to be emboldened and empowered by this by these by people that are like you that are out there going, no, I'm going to I'm gonna post this. I'm just gonna show you guys what it's like to actually go out and fucking live live life without a rope, <laughs> like live it without a rope. But I, and I and, and that's you know feasible, accessible, and appropriate at a certain period of one's life, right? Um, but like, you know, got to get out of this Peter Pan thing at some point. You know, in a way, and I'm not saying that I ever that I had that necessarily. Like, I don't want to grow up, kind of thing. But it's, um, but the, uh, like, if I've learned anything, it has been in the sort of from the reinventions that I've gone through. That if my career, first career was as a climber, right, um, and then you know during that, I I sort of learned a little bit about writing and, and shooting photographs. And, um, I did a little bit of that simultaneous with climbing. Um, but then the fitness thing became, you know, like, and, and a lot of that started with the military is that I, you know, I started out doing cold weather, high altitude stuff with right. different units. And then they realized like, Oh, he, knows a little bit about fitness and he does this thing. He's got this gym and then it morphed into the fitness thing. And then, um, and so I'd say that that's a second, you know, as a, as a fitness trainer or fitness trainer, philosopher, something, I don't know, was another hat. And then now I don't, maybe it's a publisher. I don't know what, what I, what we do now, but we're making, you know, books and stuff and, and, uh, um, like that necessity is that, that, I mean, I think it's a necessity because otherwise we, it's super easy to stagnate right. and not learn anymore. And when I stopped doing, like I said, the, the, these Hollywood jobs, I mean, the last, um, the last one that I did was, you know, with, it was the justice league movie and I had Jason on, on that. Um, and I had another 35 Amazon right. women, you know, and to, to be a dude in that space and to figure out how to train women and groups of women and not have a fucking me too moment and mm -hmm. like not misuse power and to, and, and to learn how to, to, to motivate and, right. and, and, and guide and shepherd and provide a safety net and make it a, like, like, well, if I can do this, I'm pretty much done here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Learn, learning you Got know, it. in a way or, you take 40 pounds off of a person or you add right. 20, you know, it's like, it, it's like all of those things. Like, I think I know how to do this and everything. If I stay in this space, everything will be a variation on the same thing. And I need, yeah. and I, and I want to try some, something else. So, so the next thing is it, for you is, are, are you concentrating most of your effort on the publishing or, photography combination of things like this. yeah i mean with the with the nonprofit business um and then spell that out it's that's, not yeah. it's not nonprofit it's yeah, yeah. so it's it's uh, n o n p r o p h e t got it and nonprofit.media yeah. is the is the website where that stuff i mean we'd have a a gym in our space right and there's physical training that goes on there but that's mostly michael and aaron and keegan who <laughs> do that part of it yep I walk through the gym, notice physical training occurring. <laughs> what are you talking about? I and saw you do a deadlift. I've done two this year. <laughs> <laughs> two, two reps. One of them one-handed, by the way. Um, um, <laughs> but in the, in the back, it's, you know, zines, and um, we've made a couple of books. I'm working on another one right now. Um, there will be another one. After, like, I, I think the one that I'm working on right now might be the 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 – not the last one internally, but the last current one. Right. And then I have a zine I want to do for, um, for somebody else who's made a 
bunch of electronic kind of stuff. And I'm like, you need to have physical copies to hand out. I yeah. want to do that. I want there to be a, a, a book that um, might involve Trevor and Aaron and, uh, and to, to make oh, yeah. that thing yeah, possible, cool. to yeah. make that thing a possibility. Right. It's like, hey, let us do the the, the layout, the processing, you right. know, it, 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 whole, that whole part of it, put it out there. And maybe it's on a bigger scale because maybe there's some other commercial partners yeah. who come in to help do it. But to, to, um, I, I, and if we can, if we can do that, then, then there's a lot like that can happen in that, in that space sort of aesthetically. Like, keep running into people the more i move around i'm just like holy shit this <laughs> like this kid marcus who did this um i don't know what 176 does exactly uh but he showed me a like like a a really cool video he put together and it's a it was it ended up being a multiple instagram stories um and it might it might live somewhere right you know as a whole but it was people moving through a shoot house and it was just their feet. Right. And the dance that that is of people oh, yeah. who have rehearsed that That's movement cool. and he found the That's right piece cool. of music. And it's yeah. like, I mean, it triggered, and it was, it triggered like a really strong kind of emotional feeling, the marriage right. of the music and the way that he shot it and that right. kind of thing. I thought, fuck, that is, that That's is a cool a, way to look at it's, that. It's yeah. a really cool way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it's the part that nobody, that obviously is critical to the outcome. Right. And it's the part that nobody, nobody who, sees. who hasn't done it understands right? yeah. that it's like, it's hyper, hyper critical. Yeah. And yeah. people that haven't been in that space don't know. Yeah. So it's it cool to make that easy to see it. And so the more I see, really you know, run across guys who are making cool stuff or, um, Ivan, the, the kit badger guy, he's like, yeah, we're doing a cross country bus tour and we're going to have range it range days. Yeah. He's organized them in different places, got some people supporting. So like, because there's probably people around who would love to shoot some cool, like it, you want to shoot a fucking M4 pattern 5.7 with a cool little can on the front of it? You know, you might be able to show awesome. up. You buy the ammo, you're going to show up. Um, so I, I think I think he said September 11th down in Price is the one that is the closest oh, one yeah. here. Price um, is pretty rad. That he's yeah. going gonna to do. And But he's starting in Oregon and uh, and and got this bus and he's going to pull some people on along the way and do shoot some video and probably do some podcasts. And I'm like, that's fucking rad. Yeah. <laughs> like, to yeah. go – do a neat thing like that. And, um, and the more I, I realize that there are people out there doing stuff like that. Um, the more I think we're on a track where we could maybe help fa facilitate, especially in the analog yeah. sort of space of printing and, right. and uh, having events or whatever. We're, we're, so if people want to buy your book, where, where do they find, where do they go to get that? Um, the, the only, so <laughs> I mean, Extreme Alpinism and yeah. Kiss or Kill, they're right. on Amazon. They're yeah. old. Yeah. Uh, we do sell you know, copies of Kiss or Kill on the nonprofit.media yeah. website. So, or N O N P R O P H E T yeah. dot media. And there's a, that's, you can find the podcast there too. Um, but so the big picture book that I did that, um, yeah. The, uh, so that's a year and a half ago, Refuge um, is there. There's like only a few hard backs left, right. soft covers. We've got a bunch. Um, how oh, so you still the, have some? Yeah, great. the soft covers because we re, yeah. we couldn't re I couldn't afford to reprint hardcovers because mm -hmm. it takes you know if you for us it seems like it, whatever we print it takes three hundred copies to cover the print costs. Yeah. Um, phew, yeah, reprinting the hard and it would be it would take a while to sell. It's a beautiful of them. book. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's, it's incredible. Book. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. book. Yeah. yeah, there's a. Um, there's a lot of perfectionism that went into that, yeah. <laughs> that mother. You, yeah, you flipped I mean, through, you've lived through that book. I remember the mailroom. QC if you've process. listened to this podcast, and then when you when you if you go get that book and you flip through that book, everything fucking makes sense. You're like, okay, yeah. I get it now. Never mind. I okay, see, I see. Why. I see it. Yeah, I, it, it's 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 pretty incredible. And the and the process is <laughs> fun. Yeah, it's, I mean, it was even stuff on the back end, like. Mailing them. I mean, I don't know. I'm. Oh, you, I must yeah. have mailed two or three dozen of them. Right. And just packaging them. Yeah. It was like this is how. Okay, so the the foam's gonna go like this, and we're gonna put a sticker facing this direction, and you need to check to make sure there's nothing right. that's, like everything had to be fucking perfect because it did because yeah. it did. Well, yeah, because it did. 
and they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the initial piece, especially for the, because we were asking, I mean, the, the hardback is $119. Yeah. It was 200 something for the special edition with the slipcase. And man, that's got to, that's got to show up in the right way. Yeah. You know, the person who opens that package to take that envelope off the outside and there's a box and that's stuck down with a sticker and open up and the foam is just right. Protected it perfectly. And it's wrapped in tissue paper and you know, like it has to, it has to be that way or it has to. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, yeah, it shows up in a priority mail envelope or something. The corner's bent because you didn't have the, the the care or the time or whatever to look after this thing. It means you didn't care. It means I didn't care about it as a, as an artist. And so it needs to arrive in a, well, Mark, a certain way. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate me coming out. Like this has been a am, fucking great podcast. I'm uh, fucking so stoked. Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. it's, just finally yeah, I mean, it's a seriously. great podcast. Like I really appreciate it. So, well, Mark I appreciate Dwight. a you reaching, you know, making you know, like making this happen, but also um, seeking out some other great people who've been on this, like different drives. Um, you know, I did my before we had Jack. Car on ours, yeah, yeah. you know. I I listened to him here. I, oh, you did? Know, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Rogan, because yeah, you got to do the research and seeing yeah. Kyle Lamb, who was in front of me as a student at some point, but yeah, yeah. now I'm a total <laughs> on the receiving yeah. end of all the knowledge that he's putting he's, out. He's yeah. he is um, a, a, yeah. a really solid human being, and that was a fun one to listen to. And he's so, he's a crazy person, like good crazy, good right? crazy. Like I I yeah. love like I love saying that. Like you're crazy, man. I love it. I'm like, I always call my kids crazy. I'm like, I'm not crazy. I'm like, no, no, crazy's good. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. crazy's good. Just keep it bright please, a little. <laughs> please yeah. don't be normal. Yeah. <laughs> this won't be much fun if you're yeah. normal, man. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, with the kids, just like, go ahead and wear a helmet if you have to. Yeah. Just don't be lame. <laughs> just <laughs> don't be <laughs> All right, this yeah. is Free Range American. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Bye. you.